Ranch Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're about ready to go with more big action. Thank you very much, and welcome to Georgia Championship Wrestling. I'm Gordon Sully, your host, and we have quite an hour in store for us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Championship Wrestling at ringside. This is Vince McMahon, along with wrestling's only living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television. I'm your host, Boyd Cheers, another outstanding card. Hey, guys, and welcome back to Regional Wrestling, where we... Talk the territories. That's right. Each and every week, it's territory talk right here on the show. And this week, guys, we're going to continue on with the Crockett Cup here in 1986 as part of our Mid-South UWF 1986 project. Of course, UWF running a joint show with Jim Crockett Promotions, promoting this two-part Crockett Cup event at the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am your host, Ray Russell. And shortly, we'll be joined by guest co-host Roman Gomez as we continue on with part two of the Crockett Cup. We're going into the evening event, session number two. Going to pick up where we left off. Last time, we already covered session number one. Ten matches in the books, including the entire first round and two matches of the second round. We're going to pick things up with the remainder of the second round, plus NWA world title on the line. North American champion Hacksaw Duggan defending the title against Dick Slater. So much to get into here. But before we do that, before I welcome Roman back, just a friendly reminder once again that you can listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast as well as sister shows like the Wrestling Memory Grenade, now covering the 1987 WWF project in the month of November. Just recently celebrated that 100th episode, that milestone episode of the Grenade Show. You can listen to Regional Wrestling, the Memory Grenade, Monday Warfare, all about the Monday Night War. And upcoming later in the month of September, our brand new podcast here at WrestleCopia. It's the Wrestling Stoop with wrestling legend Bob Roop. Going to share his stories, memories, and things he learned throughout his wrestling career, both inside the ring as well as behind the scenes as a wrestler, a booker, and just an observationalist, if you will. Bob Roop is full of stories, full of memories. It's going to be an exciting time when the Wrestling Stoop comes to the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, and you guys can listen to all of those shows and more over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Google, and beyond. And don't forget to follow me on social media, guys, for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. You can follow me on Twitter, or X, if you will. Follow me on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, guys. YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And certainly, last but definitely not least, I want to invite you guys to give it a try. I'm talking about that $5 all access tier over at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, Patreon.com slash wrestle c-o-p-i-a and what do you get as part of that five dollar all access tier you might be asking me well first of all you get all of my insanely detailed book-like show notes for the wrestling memory grenade monday warfare of course regional wrestling and maybe some notes there for the upcoming bob roop podcast as well we'll have to wait and see what we do with that you guys will also get early access to many of the podcasts here on wrestlecopia where you can listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier. And now that Patreon is integrated into Spotify, if you have a Patreon account, you can actually listen to the audio shows that drop early on Spotify. All you have to do is have the link and be connected to Patreon. It's that simple, guys. Very exciting times. So you get the show notes, you get early access, but you also get remastered versions of the earliest episode of The Grenade Show covering 1989 and the NWA That includes enhanced sound quality and new content and conversation that was originally edited out of the show, edited right back in. But that's still not all. You guys get digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure. And of course, our Patreon-exclusive watch-along series covering many past WWF and WCW pay-per-views, Coliseum videos, Saturday night's main events, Clash of the Champions, and so much more. And we're still not done because you also get random bonus video drops. You never know when they're going to drop. Most recently. 4.5 hours, that's four and a half hours of new bonus video footage there. All of it complimentary to this Crockett Cup, this two-part 
Crockett Cup podcast here in 1986, the video footage, an excellent complimentary piece to our ongoing podcast here. And who knows, me and Bob Roop going to get together, have a little discussion, see what we can add here to the All Access tier, perhaps. So now would be a great time to join while there's still a few slots open. And you guys get all of that for the low, low price of just $5. No subscription, cancel any time. Show your support. Give it a try for a month. I think you'll like all the content that I offer. And every penny of it, guys, it doesn't buy me a vacation. I'm not using it to buy tickets to WrestleMania. I'm not even using it for a burger and a six-pack of beer. No, no, guys. Every penny of your Patreon donation goes right back here into keeping the WrestleCopia Podcast Network up and running for the months and the years to come. And now with all of that said, all of that out of the way, I'm about as excited as you guys are. Yes, indeed. Time to jump back in to Crockett Cup 86. Oh my God, I can't get enough of those old NWA themes. Takes me back to my childhood. Always great to listen to that. It never gets old. Speaking of someone who never gets old, I don't really know where I was going with that. However, he is here once again. We talked to him last time. We paid tribute to Terry Funk, Bray Wyatt. And of course, we covered the first half of Crockett Cup 86. Now we're going to jump into the second half here. And in order to do that, I got to bring him back to the show talking about the former co host of the Mid Atlantic Championship podcast, now a recurring guest co-host here on regional wrestling i'm talking about roman gomez roman are you ready for crockett cup 86 part D? yes i am i had a blast on the on the last episode talking about the first part of the crockett cup and definitely looking forward to talking about the evening session that we're going to talk about this week yeah it's fun back-to-back shows covering the crockett cup wasn't so fun last episode talking about terry funk and bray wyatt but i did get a lot of feedback on that a lot of people appreciated us not just glancing over uh, some of the recent passing of, of some very major stars in the history of the business. And well, I definitely wanted to get that in at the beginning of last uh, episode show. Luckily, since that time, no other big news out there, at least in the way of uh, any wrestling deaths, unless you count CM Punk's career at this point anyway. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've, we've heard a lot about that. <laughs> I'd much yeah, rather I, talk old school wrestling. Yeah, I can't go on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now without, you know, my, my entire screen flooded with that. So I kind of would like to just move past that. So that was my only mention of it here on the show, hopefully anyway. Uh, But Roman, I guess if you're ready, we'll jump into the second half of the Crockett Cup show. Yeah, let's do it. All right, guys. So away we go with event number two from the inaugural Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup Tag Team Tournament, also taking place April 19th, 1986 at the Superdome in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's session number two, the evening session, guys. Starting time, 7.30 p.m. until when, Roman? Question mark. That lovely question mark. Exactly. <laughs> the question mark of doom. is We should have dubbed it after what we were talking about last episode about some of these shows just going a little too long. Question mark looks good on paper. Maybe not so much in reality. 
we're all human and everybody's got an attention span and some are longer than others. And you start pushing wrestling past the three hour mark. You're, you might be asking for some trouble. Asking for trouble. That's exactly what I was thinking. Now, remember guys, initially this was a 24 team single elimination tournament. And after event number one earlier in the afternoon, we whittled it down to 14 teams. So 10 teams gone. We saw eight first round matches in the first Two second round matches as well. Ten teams eliminated thus far in the tournament. Many more to go as there can only be one winner. Remember, guys, one million dollars, air quotes around that, is on the line. As we're going to pick things up here at the second event with the remaining six second round matches. Each of those matches featuring one team that advanced from the first round versus a top eight seeded team who received a bye in the first round. Plus, we've also got a couple of bonus matches throughout the evening as Dick Slater challenging Hacksaw Jim Duggan for the North American title and NWA world champion Ric Flair defending his title against the Mac and Dream, Dusty Rhodes, baby. A quick refresher, guys, of results from the first event earlier tonight. First round matches saw Wahoo McDaniel and Mark Youngblood defeat the Portland area team of Hangman Bobby Jaggers and Mean Mike Miller. It was Nelson Royal and Sam Houston over Brad and Bart, the Batten Twins from Central States. Jimmy Valiant teaming with Rage and Bull Manny Fernandez over Baron Von Raschke and the Barbarian of Jones's Army. Also, Dr. Death Steve Williams, Terry Taylor down the team of Superstar Bill Dundee and the Nature Boy Buddy Landell. Then from there, it was the Sheep Herders stealing a victory away from Hector and Chavo Guerrero. And then from there, easily the headline match of round one, UWF Tag Team Champions, the Fantastics, eliminated the Fabulous Ones. Remember this one, Roman? It was Rick Steiner and Buzz Sawyer over that top-level team of the Birdman, Coco Beware, and the Italian Stallion. 15-minute match. Remember that one, Roman? Yes, yes. 15 <laughs> minutes and about 10 minutes too long. And I wanted to apologize in advance if you hear any noise. It is raining again. Awfully hard here. So there might be an- uh, <laughs> animals walking in pairs, I should say, by my house. Uh, we got a lot of rain here this past weekend. So you if you know, hear any uh-huh. crazy noise. That's rain. Off topic, you know, Roman, you sent me a couple pictures of what it looks like out there in Vegas right now. Oh, my gosh. You ain't lying, man. Talk about building an ark. Got a little bit of flooding going on over there. Yeah, it's it's bad. And uh, it's better than it was growing up here. It's a lot better than it was. But And then you factor in people don't know how to drive when it's sunny. Just imagine trying to drive in two feet of water in some of, some areas in town. It, it gets a little crazy here when it rains. Yeah, those pictures were crazy. And those looked like some main roads. So. I uh, hope everything is, you know, goes well out there and everything dries up quickly. <laughs> Unfortunately, I bring up the Italian stallion while you're dealing with all that. So a double bummer there. But we'll try to cheer you up here as we continue on with Crockett Cup session two. But before we do that, a couple more matches here. Closing out the first round, it was also Jimmy Garvin and Black Bart defeating Brett Wayne Sawyer and Dave Peterson. And then we also saw two second round matches. They already took place as part of session number one. Uh, we saw number three seed, the Midnight Express. That's the current NWA World Tag Team Champion. Midnight Express, lover boy Dennis, beautiful Bobby, over the team of Nelson Royal and Sam Houston. Match went less than two minutes. And then from there, it was number two seed, Magnum TA and Ronnie Garvin, over the Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer and Rick Steiner. Now, both the Midnight Express and Garvin Magnum, those teams will advance into the quarterfinals. And that brings us to here. Session number two, referees for this event. Carl Fergie, Earl Hebner, Tommy Gilbert, and Tommy Young. Ring announcer once again here, Bruce Pritchard. Also going to see special guest ring announcers, Jim Ross, Tony Schiavone, and Paul Bosch in town. And remember, guys, $10 general admission seating for that earlier afternoon show only drew 3,500 fans and $40,000. That was 1986 money. Not sure ticket prices here for event number two, Roman, but they draw substantially more fans here. 13,000 fans out this time, in fact, for the evening event for a gross of $180,000. Are you guys ready for this? That's over a half a million, $502,000 after inflation. Not too shabby. Well, I think a big part of it, too, going into the second session, you knew what you were getting to a certain extent. You knew you were getting flair and dusty. That was going to be a draw. Right. You knew you were getting Duggan and Slater, and Duggan was a big deal in that area. And then, of course, you're going to see the end of the movie. You're going to see who is crowned, who's going to win the 
Crockett Cup Championship. There we go. Right, and some of the teams you knew were clearly going to be part of that second show, like the number one seed Road Warriors, which are another big draw. So lots of big names. Come, everybody's coming out for the big names. And like you said, the end of the movie. We know we're going to see who wins that Crockett Cup. And uh, we certainly will before this episode of Regional Wrestling is over. Now, I said they drew 13,000 fans, a gate of over $500,000 in 2023 money. Sounds great financially, but the reality is 13,000 fans is the fourth smallest Superdome crowd in wrestling history to that point. That's the fourth smallest out of 26 shows. So 22 times they've ran the Superdome and seen larger crowds. Now, some of that is also likely the decline we've seen in business in the Mid-South Territory. One of the things that forced Bill Watts out of business, really, over 1985, 1986, due to that oil crisis they talked about. But interesting, nonetheless. And I would have loved to known if anybody out there knows, can hit me or Ray up, like, what were the ticket prices for the second session? You know, how much I would think they would have to charge a little bit more. I mean, you are getting a world title match. You're getting the crowning of the champions. You're getting better marquee matchups. I'm sure there was an uptick in the ticket prices. I'd be curious to see what that was. Well, they were hard selling event number one at that $10 seating. They did not say that for two. So absolutely, there's definitely a price increase. What it was, I, I don't know. I'm sure I could do a little math here and figure it out with 13000 divided by how much the, the gate was. I guess I should have done that, and I didn't. So I do apologize, guys. But basic math, maybe I'll drop it for you guys uh on the next episode of, of regional wrestling here, but definitely clearly, I mean, there was a, a price increase what it was. I'm not sure, but it was still 1980s. So the prices probably still didn't get too out of hand. Yeah. And uh, I don't think they would have priced it out of the ballpark where people were like, ah, we don't want to go to that. I'm sure there was an uptick, but it was probably still very reasonable. Sure. I, I could see it uh, being still under $20 for, for most seats. I would say. Yeah. That that was going to be my guess, maybe $5 more, you know, or something like that. Yeah, I was thinking around that $15, $16 mark. But uh, as we get going again, a reminder, we went back and watched the edited down two-hour version shown on home video. We also went back to the WWE Vault, originally released as part of the Hidden Gym segment of the old WWE Network. It was the majority of the entire two-event spectacular, including all of event number two, which we're covering here this week, shown in its entirety, every match, in its completest form. Very cool, Roman. And we're going to break it all down for you guys right here this week on Regional Wrestling. As we go, session number two of the Supercard begins with Tony Schiavone in the ring to introduce local UWF announcer, good old JR. You guys know him also as Jim Ross. Ross runs down the reels of the tournament here. Would have been nice if they had done that at the beginning of session number one, Roman, but okay. We learned that there will be 20-minute time limits, at least for now in the tournament. A double disqualification equals both teams eliminated. Double countout, both teams eliminated. Time limit draw, and both teams are out. The UWF reels have been waived in favor of Jim Crockett Promotions. That means coming off the top rope and pile drivers are now legal. However, foreign objects and intentionally throwing your opponent over the top rope are still illegal and will result in a disqualification. Tag teams are allowed one save per match as Jim Ross then runs down some of the teams still involved here for session two before we all rise for the playing of our national anthem. And then we're off to Brucey, ring announcer Bruce Pritchard as the second round continues here in the Crockett Cup as we begin event number two. And here we go, Roman. It's time for the Road Warriors versus Wahoo and Mark Youngblood. There you said it. There we go. We saw Wahoo and Mark Youngblood advance in the first round in the first match. So they've had a nice long time, a break here. Wahoo's going to be part of that big Wrestle Rock show the following day as well. Yep. He's one of uh, one of a handful of people that got to get double duty. Something like eight or nine guys travel from the Crockett Cup straight to Wrestle Rock the following day. Some big events going on here at this time frame in 1986. It was fun to be a fan, and I remember when the Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine came out a few months later, and they were covering super cards, and to see both of them on the cover was uh, kind of cool as a fan to see that. Oh, yeah, all the pictures in the magazines around that time, even WrestleMania too. just a lot of great pictures throughout that those, the next few months in those uh, after mags and such things. I was, I was in heaven, i got to say that much. 
We, we really came from a different era, didn't we? I mean, there was no, let, let's go to Google and let's go to <laughs> right. the Internet and look at the pictures and see the results. And months later, like, oh, okay, look, look at the crowd or look at this guy in the ring. And we had to wait a long time to get the majority of the results from the, these types of shows. Yeah, and whether you were 10 or 20, you know, if you're collecting those magazines and looking at those pictures, I have to think we were all using our imaginations of, wow, how cool was that match? What probably took place during that match? Like one picture, they say is pictures worth a thousand words and really a picture is worth a thousand moves back in the day because that's all I did was envision what, what, what else could have happened in the match besides this one picture here. Yeah, that's it. You know, your imagination was what helped you create the, the magic you wanted to happen. Or, you know, there wasn't tons of corresponding with people across the country or, you know, you, you didn't normally have buddies call you from across the country. Did you see that? Did you see <laughs> you had to wait for the magazines to, yeah. to see what happened? Absolutely. As we get rolling here, guys, second round action continues on. Matches have a 20 minute time limit. And as Roman said, we kick things off with the number one seed. It's Hawk and Animal, the Road Warriors taking on Wahoo McDaniel and Mark Youngblood. Former NWA World Tag Team Champions, a couple years ago anyway. Wahoo and Youngblood advanced earlier over the team of Mike Miller and Bobby Jaggers. Now the roadies, they received a bye in the first round as they come to the ring, but not to Iron Man, Roman, but rather their quote-unquote song that they quote-unquote sang as part of that, I think it was AWA music video. Uh, just the roadies speaking into the microphone. I don't know about you, Roman, but I would have preferred no music to this. Oh, yeah, that was horrible. Such a letdown. <laughs> All these years later to see the match in its entirety, and then they come out to the one, like you said, where they're talking. I'm the hawk. I'm the animal. That's right. You know, and it's like we wanted to hear Iron Man, you know, that that Road Warrior pop you always hear about. And a big part of that was that song of Iron Man when it would start off and the crowd would just go crazy. It's going to be a rope off tonight because we're the Warriors. That's right. Because I'm Hawk and the animal. That's right. And I'm not, you know, just just saying it when I say I'd rather have no music at all. I think it would have done them better had they just come out Hawk and animal badasses to the ring rather than the, this yeah. ridiculous whatever this was. And in in hindsight, if you go back and watch the video, you can have some fun watching the video. Yes, guys, but. To play yourself to the ring to this, I don't know who thought this was a good idea, and I feel like they abandoned it for the rest of the show. Yeah, and exactly. And when they did that in the AWA, at least when they did that video and you would see them in the studio doing the talking, they would also show clips of them beating people to a pulp. Sure. So at least there was that. But them walking to the ring to them talking. I'm the hawk. I'm the animal. That's not really intimidating <laughs> for two badasses. No, we'll have to see what they do in the ring here. As ring announcer Bruce Pritchard shouts to do the ring introductions here. He almost goes into his brother love voice. He's shouting so loud. And it's funny hearing, quote unquote, brother love introducing the matches at the Crockett Cup as Carl Fergie, the referee for this one. And right out of the gate, Road Warrior Animal showing his power by catching a Mark Youngblood crossbody, turning it down into a backbreaker as the roadies then working over Youngblood before Wahoo McDaniel and next as Hawk tries to trade chops with Wahoo, never wise Hawk. I don't care how tough you are. Animal then tagged in, but he too eats a Wahoo chop across the chest, taking Animal down. McDaniel finally able to tag back to Youngblood, who immediately runs into a Hawk flying shoulder tackle. Mark tries to battle back, but misses a really nice looking flying double tomahawk chop move. And Youngblood stumbles up into a middle rope clothesline from the Road Warrior Hawk. Nasty clothesline gets the one. Wait a minute. Wahoo in two. Wahoo over top of the cover. But three. Wahoo McDaniel literally got in the ring, Roman, stood over top of the cover for the majority of the pinfall and did nothing. Weirdest non-save I've ever seen, perhaps in wrestling history. But the Road Warriors advanced to take on the Midnight Express in the quarterfinals. This match went four minutes and 20 seconds. And that is, I had that too. Weird spot at the end is Wahoo comes in the ring and gets close to Hawk, watches the whole count of three, and never even attempted to break up the pin. And 
it's it was just mind boggling. You know, this is a million dollars on the line. You know, at least act like you want to save your partner. He just stood there and watched the whole thing. I, I guess Wahoo didn't need the million dollars after all. Probably didn't, but at the same time, Wahoo. I mean, what a veteran knew to come up. I, I maybe he thought Animal was going to cut him off. I don't know what the deal was, but you say got close to Hawker. I don't know how you how you worded it, but seriously, guys, go watch this for yourself. Wahoo McDaniel is literally standing over top of the cover watching Hawk pin his partner and does absolutely nothing about it. And the worst part, you were allowed one save, so it wouldn't even have gotten him a disqualification. Shame on you, Wahoo, as the Road Warriors advance. <laughs> yeah, so, something was off there. You know, like you said, maybe Animal was late g- coming into the ring to hit Wahoo and k- get him away from the pin. Uh, that was just very – I've never seen that in any match, you know, no. and then to have it – shown on camera for a prestigious tournament with a million dollars on the line, him just watching his partner get pinned. Very weird. <laughs> and uh, we roll on, Definitely. guys. Another matchup. Jimmy Valiant, Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant and Rage and Bull, Manny Fernandez taking on the number eight seed, the Russians, Ivan and Nikita Koloff. And oh, wait, before we start this one, a little bonus here, guys, for the teams are announced. Paul Jones and Shaska Watley return to the ring. Shaska holding up a lock of the Boogie Woogie Man's hair, recently cut by Watley during his heel turn on Jimmy Valiant. Pez Watley getting, I'm sorry, Shaska Watley getting on the mic here, vowing that Jones's army will end the Boogie Woogie Man once and for all, referring to Valiant as a white Uncle Tom. And I'm not even sure how that's possible, but I love it anyway. Watley daring Valiant to come get his hair, talking about putting a whippin on Jimmy's ass. Oh, he said it, guys. I wrote, uh oh, got to change the parental ratings in this one. <laughs> I, I just thought that was kind of a weird segment, you know, that he calls out Valiant, Valiant comes and they run away. And I, I don't know. It was just kind of a weird little segment to me. And you could tell this was clearly done specifically because this is a Crockett show at the end of the day on a Crockett tape involving Shaska, Pez Watley, if you will, in not one, but two, both sessions of the show in the Jimmy Valiant matches. Yeah, yeah, I guess they were trying to get Shoska over a little bit more as a heel, but uh, you, you want to see something. You know, the baby face comes out and the heel run. I don't know. I, I, I think they could have used that time to add on to a couple of the matches. And talk about cramming guys into the show. This goes on as Team Valiant and Fernandez are out with referee Carl Fergie forcing Watley and Paul Jones to leave ringside from there. Of course, Valiant and Manny Fernandez already defeated Jones's army members. The Barbarian and Baron von Raschke in round number one, and now they've got the fresh Russian team who received a bye. As Ivan and Nikita Koloff out next, but they're not alone, accompanied to ringside by Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert and the UWF's Russian Korsita Korchenko. Gilbert likely pissed off that Hot Stuff International was overlooked here in this tournament. No Blade Runners, damn it. Uh, but Eddie Gilbert on the mic says the Russians will win it all and take the $1 million in American money back to the Soviet Union. Good to see Eddie on the show. Yeah, yeah, even if it was just as a mouthpiece, so to speak. It would have been nice to see him in the ring, but anytime you see Eddie Gilbert, it's normally a a good good occurrence. Watts was pretty good about working some of his guys into the show, even if they weren't competing. I I will see that again later as well, but I just love to see, you know, any reason you have to put Eddie Gilbert out there, even if it's just to cut a quick promo, I love it. They got him in the corner of the Coloss for this one, maybe getting some extra local heat. Not that maybe Nikita really needs it. As we get going, Manny Fernandez, Nikita Koloff going to start this out. And Nikita looking in rough shape right away. Bandaged forehead and a big black eye. Uh, back when wrestling was real, people. You know, like, like you said with Gilbert, he got a little more heat on the Russians. And uh, you can hear the crowd chanting, Russia sucks. And you can clearly <laughs> hear that. So uh, it, was, it was definitely good to hear the crowd passionate and fire, fired up about a match. Match gets going. Koloff, that's Nikita Koloff, overpowers Fernandez early on. So Manny goes to his wrestling skills to finally get the big Russian down. Uncle Ivan then tags in from there. And it isn't too long before we rekindle the feud that would never end. Before it was Valiant and Paul Jones, there was Valiant and Ivan Koloff about 500 times in a row. You know all too well about that, Roman. And we get that here again, if only for a moment. Remember the lovely matches or the the lovely feud that just wouldn't quit that Ivan Koloff and Jimmy Valiant feud of 1982. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's still going. Is it still going? Maybe still going somewhere today. <laughs> Ivan Koloff's waiting for him somewhere. I know. I just know it. 
<laughs> well, it's it's funny you said that. You know, I, I got to meet Ivan Koloff before he passed away, and they were both at the same Cauliflower Alley, and I was honestly expecting them to have something going on in the memorabilia room to set up an angle. They'd, they'd gone at each other's throat for so many years. In real life, you can't help but, you know, become pretty good friends. I mean, if you're going to continue on for that long, you'd have to think those guys. I know you, you said in the past yourself that, you know, they they were, I don't know how great friends they were, but they certainly were, you know, they got along and, and they respected one another. Oh, yeah, definitely. They, they both spoke highly of each other. They had the same uh, same faith and, and they were buddies and everything. And they talked about that. And you could see it at Cauliflower Alley that they, they were pretty close. That's cool. They're very, very cool because... Uh, Ivan had to have appreciated working Jimmy Valiant for that longer period of time because every night had to be a night off. No, no really over <laughs> overworking yourself in the ring. No hard bumps necessarily. Uh, you know, just a fun night uh, each and every night, I'm sure, between those two. You know, and then plus, I mean, people love to see it. They kept coming out for it. You know, <laughs> so they they made a they definitely made a couple bucks off the feud. That's for sure. That's what I was gonna say. For as long as those two worked against each other, it must have worked to some degree because people were still buying tickets. Yeah, and, and even, you know, you add on Nikita, and then, of course, Valiant could get a Manny Fernandez or a Ronnie Garvin or, you know, somebody else, and you could just kind of keep it freshened up a little bit, but still the fans would be waiting to see Ivan and Valiant get in the ring against each other. Well, here it is again, rekindling the old feud between the Boogeyman and Ivan Kolov. Jimmy Valiant stomping Ivan in the crotch. Ugh. And then Manny Fernandez adding insult to injury, or maybe more injury to injury here, driving the Russian Bear crotch first into the ring post behind referee Carl Fergie's back, to the crowd's delight, I might add. Uh, Fernandez misses a dropkick, though, on Ivan, and Nikita tags back in to take over for the Russians. So Manny, he takes the heat here, locked in a bear hug or two, but Ivan goes to the top rope, and Fernandez slams him off, and a hot tag to, woo, mercy, Jimmy Valiant, back in one more time. Boogie Woogie in on Uncle Ivan and locks in a sleeper, but Nikita Koloff comes in from behind, clobbering Jimmy, causing the break. And it becomes a four-way melee from there. And while the referee gets Fernandez back to his corner, Valiant ducks an Ivan Koloff clothesline, but stands back up right into a Nikita Russian sickle. Fun spot as the Russians get the win. Eight minutes and 59 seconds. And I wrote, well, I wanted to see Nikita in the ring with Valiant. We didn't really get that here, but we did get a Russian sickle. So I can't really complain for what it was, not too bad outside of that bear hug stuff. Like I said earlier, the crowd being into it, it just adds so much more to the match when the crowd's not sitting on its hands. And they cared, so it made you want to care a little bit more. Yeah, and 13,000 strong, not 3,500 like we saw in Session 1. So the crowd a little more noisy here for Session 2. Not that they weren't for a few matches earlier, so I look forward as the show goes on to some of these matches and the crowd response. But we won't get it here in the next matchup, Roman, if you want to call it that. It's the number 10 seed, Dr. Death, Steve Williams, teaming with Terry Taylor, taking on the number 5 seed, the Canadian representatives, Rick Martell and Dino Bravo. Dr. Death and Taylor entered round two after a win over Bill Dundee and Buddy Landell in session one, while the French-Canadian duo received a bye. And oh man, here we go, Roman, the sleeper match for me, my dream match here, Rick Martell up against Terry Taylor, and even more so, Rick Martell versus Dr. Death. So pumped for this one, but uh, Rick Martell is not dressed to wrestle. Out here in a suit, what is going on here? Dino Bravo also noticeably missing from the ring altogether. We see Martell talking over something with Bruce Pritchard and referee Tommy Gilbert, and then we learn that apparently Dino Bravo has been quote unquote seriously injured with appendicitis. I just thought it was. Oddly worded there by Bruce Pritchard, seriously injured with appendicitis, like somebody put that upon him. Uh, but uh, apparently Dino Bravo cannot go. And this was a legitimate happening, a legitimate injury, by the way, guys. So Dr. Death and Terry Taylor will advance by forfeit. And for some reason, the crowd applauds. Now, I get your local team just advanced, guys, but you're being ripped off a top level match. And out of the replacements on the card already. We know Tully in for Flair, Garvin in for Dusty, et cetera, et cetera. They couldn't find Martell a suitable replacement partner with all these extra guys just walking around backstage. I wrote, boo, not a fan of this announcement at all. Yeah, and it would have been nice if they said, okay, Rick, 
Your partner's unavailable. Of all the people that have been eliminated, you're allowed to choose one of them as your partner. Something along those lines. So you feel like you get something out of it. Would it work? I mean, really, at the end of the day, Jack Victory, no stranger to this moving forward, but toss Jack Victory in a mask. You know, I mean, Shaska Watley's walking around, and I'm not saying you got to pick those guys, but I mean, there are people back there who aren't competing at all, and I'm sure there was a few more as well. Eddie Gilbert, I mean, just lots of names come to mind, but like you said, there were a lot of people eliminated that would have made sense in this spot, and they only got this spot because of somebody went down at the last minute, and you want to give the fans something here instead of take something away, and they took this away from me, Roman, I'll tell you that much. And and it's very weird that not only did they get a bye, but now it's time for them to wrestle. Oh, well, they can't wrestle now. Uh, there, there had to have been something, some way. So, I mean, creative minds, you know, in the back, uh, Dusty, Watts, you know, the, these guys, Ross, like somebody couldn't have came up with something, you know, to give us an extra match or to give us a match, not an extra match, but to give us a match. And then, like you said, I mean, that would have been fun to see Martell and T- Taylor in the ring against each other. Yeah, it's a, it's a head scratcher, the decision overall. I mean, Rick Martel came all the way down from Canada, literally from Montreal, the Montreal territory, uh, with, you know, to work with Dino Bravo. He's working the AWA recently as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this match. And they're like, no, not going to happen. But Rick Martel's in the ring. No, nope, not going to happen. Move along. And it's kind of upsetting. And we know Rick Martel going to go on to Wrestle Rock the following day to work Harley Race. They'll go to a double count out. But Rick Martel was ready to go here. No health issues with him, so there's really no reason for this. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, one of the many things that was head scratching about this tournament. You know, all these years we we broke down the brackets on another podcast, and just uh, yeah, there were several things that they could have tightened up and made it made it make a little more sense. So, Doctor Death and Terry Taylor will advance into the quarterfinals to take on the Russians, Ivan and Nikita Koloff. Doctor Death versus Nikita. Hopefully, that doesn't disappoint. As uh, we roll on, it's number nine seed, the Sheep Herders, with Jack Victory in their corner, taking on the number six seed, the Rock and Roll Express. And the Rock and Rolls, the recent NWA World Tag Team Champions, losing the belts to the Midnight Express. They have to be the favorites in this matchup, you'd have to think. Then again, the Sheep Herders, also recently the UWF Tag Team Champions, having defeated Dr. Death and Ted DiBiase before dropping those belts to the Fantastics. So both teams, uh, recently former world tag team champions in their respective promotions as the rock and rolls. They got a buy into the second round while the sheep herders defeated the very competent team of the Guerrero brothers in round number one. Yeah. And what a dream matchup of the rock and roll express versus the sheep herders, you know, two two teams that were legendary in the mid South UWF area and to see them go up against each other. And then to see the whole match courtesy of the peacock network, very happy about that. Yeah, these two teams certainly made for each other. Ricky Morton selling versus the Sheep Herders bloodthirsty. I mean, it just writes itself. If you could have given these guys a real program and, and had some really lengthy matches between the two teams. Now, before the match here, the New Zealanders, they salute their flag, prompting the Rock and Rolls to find an American flag near ringside. How about that, guys? Ricky Morton bringing the old glory into the ring to salute the flag to a big pop from the fans. The local fans are very familiar with Ricky and Robert going back before their run on TBS. Of course, the Rock and Roll's legendary here in the Mid-South Territory. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you can't help but think of the Rock and Roll Express. You think of the Midnights. You know, the tremendous series of matches there. And, uh, yeah, what, what a simple, old-school formula. You know, you have the baby faces that people love against the hated foreigners. I mean... This match was going to draw money on its own, but then part of the Crockett Cup just makes it a little more special. Yeah, and as the match gets going, it's almost three minutes of stalling before they ever lock up here. Robert Gibson caught in the wrong corner, though, but Ricky Morton got to help his partner right out, and they send the Herders out to the floor. Finally, though, Sheep Herders returning to the ring, and eventually they're able to get Robert Gibson in their corner, sending him to the floor, where Butch sends Gibson into the ring post. Boy, something feels wrong here. Robert Gibson playing the part of Ricky Morton, taking the beat down for the Rock and Rolls. But old Hoot Gibson finally able to dropkick Butch and make the hot tag out to Punky Morton. Morton in a house of fire, leading to the double dropkick. The finisher of the Rock and Rolls on Butch Miller. Morton down for the cover, but the referee trying to get Gibson and Luke out of the ring. And Jack Victory sneaking in from behind with that dastardly New Zealand flagpole. Victory trying to take a stab at Morton with the pole. But victory misses, and Morton takes the flag away. And then it's Ricky Morton caught using 
that flagpole on Jack Victory, and that somehow gets the Rock and Rolls disqualified. After eight minutes and 40 seconds of action, shenanigans on that evil UWF official Carl Fergie here, helping a UWF team to advance. I'm just kidding, guys. I know that's not really the case, but fun little side story. I wrote, you know, Roman, you might have, you know, enjoyed this match. By the way, you were talking going into it, but I wrote pretty lame finish as the match never really got going for me. And the disqualification, I would have bought it more if Morton had at least hit Butch with the flag. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it would have been nice to see a different type of finish, you know, even if the rock and rolls didn't go over, but to see a different type of finish. But, you know, th- this match, something that struck out with me was that the crowd was 100 percent behind the rock and roll express oh yeah you know a lot of times you would you would yeah you would you would see you know an occasional fan root for the heel like i think everybody in the building was in favor of the rock and roll express and that kind of stood out to me because there's always been pockets of of, uh, heel fans in the crowd here and there but you didn't see that during this match everybody was usa usa and root for the rock and roll express And I wonder if a little bit of that has to do with the fact that there's so many other great heels here that they can root for that maybe they're like, eh, all right, I'll give it a pass this time. I'll root for the good guy in this one, but who knows? But I I agree with you, man. It really did feel like 100% solidarity uh, behind Team USA there in the Rock and Roll Express. Unfortunately, they're eliminated, but I'd love to see a whole lot more from those two teams. But unfortunately, it's not going to happen here tonight on the Crockett Cup as we roll on with UWF Tag Team Champions Bobby Fulton, Tommy Rogers, The Fantastics, taking on seed number four, NWA television champion Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard of the Horsemen. They're accompanied to the ring by manager J.J. Dillon, as the referee for this one is Earl Hebner. And the Fantastics here after defeating the Fabulous Ones in round one, and then the Horsemen getting a bye. Remember Tully Blanchard replacing Ric Flair here in this matchup, as Tully Blanchard, Tommy Rogers start out trading hard shots against one another, which Rogers actually wins. And then Arn Anderson in to give it a go, but Rogers with the speed. Multiple drop kicks, sending Anderson bailing out as the Fantastic celebrate early on with stereo Fargo struts. As we learn, five minutes have elapsed, and Bobby Fulton finally, for the first time, five minutes in, tags into the matchup, and he gets tossed out to the floor by Anderson, where old JJ, JJ Dillon, gets in a few cheap shots as well. And then Fulton back inside with a slingshot sunset flip on Arn, got a net him a two count, but the Horsemen immediately cut Bobby back off, and Tully sends Fulton back to the floor. Back inside once more, and Fulton eats an Arn Anderson spine buster. That'll get the job done in later years, but here, it only gets Arn a two count. And then Fulton, say it with me, Roman, gets tossed back out to the floor. (laughs) A third time. Okay, guys, get a little lazy on Arn and Tully's part. I I wrote that in my notes anyway. As Tully tries for a suplex on the outside, but Tommy Rogers makes the save, for partner Fulton out there, as 10 minutes have now elapsed in the time limit, Fulton rolls back in, and we get the same trunk pull again that we saw in round number one, exposing Fulton's hind end. So if you missed it at the matinee show, Roman, here you go again. Sure made the women happy. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, maybe a couple guys, too. And uh, <laughs> back in the ring, though, Arn Anderson. Uh, Arn, however, misses a charging knee in the corner and jams his leg, allowing the hot tag to Tommy Rogers. As Tommy goes to work on both horsemen, but he telegraphs a backdrop, and Anderson counters with his finisher, the Gourd Buster, on Tommy Rogers, gets the one, two, but Bobby Fulton, unlike Wahoo McDaniel, breaks up the count. Good move there, Bobby. As Anderson then scoops Rogers up for a slam, but the referee busy with Tully Blanchard, so Fulton sneaks back in, dropkick to partner Rogers back, the momentum causing Arn to tumble backwards. Rogers falls on top and gets the one, two, three. The Fantastics advance. Didn't see that coming. 11 minutes and 22 seconds. And these two teams also wrestled at Crockett Cup 88, and that would have been a fun match to see that one in its entirety as well. But, uh, yeah, I this one kind of surprised me. The Fantastics going over surprised me a little bit, but on commentary, Shivani called it an upset. And I don't really see that as an upset because at this point in time, Arn and Tully were both singles champion. Arn was the television champion and Tully was a national champion. Right. And they hadn't teamed a whole bunch at this Not time. Not much at all. Yeah. And the fantastic. Yeah. So I didn't see that as the upset that Shivani was presenting it to be. You know, maybe he was doing it for dramatic effect, but you had made reference to, 
you know, Fulton getting thrown to the outside. I did like that whenever he went outside, JJ was always there to give him a boot. Right. You know, and I always liked when the when the heel manager would give him a boot, and then the ref would look up, and the you know the heel manager would obviously lie. And I didn't kick him; I was just trying to help him up. You know, and it, it just little things like that would incite the crowd, and that's something I always liked. I always appreciated when heels did something like that. You know, you talked about Tony Schiavone doing something for a dramatic effect. No, not Tony Schiavone. Never. <laughs> no, but I get where, you know, if people are watching this from back in the day now, they're thinking, well, Arn and Tully were one of the most legendary tag teams of all time. What are they talking about? They, they absolutely had upset. Well, it's possible if you look at it from that perspective. But like you said, Arn and Tully really hadn't teamed up much at all at this point, really. It was more Arn and Flair or Tully and Flair or Arn and Ole and things like that. And uh, every once in a while, if you get a six man or something, the two would team, maybe they randomly got thrown together on a TV episode or two that I can't even think of off the top of my head right now, but they weren't a team walking into this like they would be in years following. So it was still an upset, I guess, to the Crockett fans because they were the horsemen, the elite, if you will, rarely did jobs. So I still see where Tony's coming from with it being an upset, but not to the Mid-South fans. No, not at all. The Fantastics were just such a smooth tag team and it didn't surprise you for them to get a victory over anybody, really. I mean, if you look back, I mean, they never wrestled the Road Warriors. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if they beat the Sheep Herders, you didn't think, oh, these two pretty boys uh, got a victory. It was like, no, that was a legit solid tag team. So whenever they emerged victorious, to, to me, it wasn't a surprise. Right. So many times, too, we've seen the heels make use of the referee's distraction. And in this instance, it was the baby faces, the Fantastics advancing to take on the sheep herders here and you can't blame the referee in this instance guys if you want to blame uwf favoritism because the referee for this one was jim crockett promotions own earl hebner at least i think that was earl i don't think that was dave i don't think he snuck in there no shenanigans here they'll save that for 1988 wwf but more of the same as last match for me though roman in this matchup maybe even more so in this one it was like the match never really got going for me based on the teams involved it was like 11 minutes of very little action. Lots of Bobby Fulton selling out there on the floor. You talk about a night off for Arn and Tully. One match in and out. They didn't really have to do a whole lot compared to what they normally do. For me, again, maybe it was, you know, I like I like that, you, you know, you have differing opinion here. Because for me, I wrote huge disappointment. I guess I was expecting more from the Horsemen in their only match of the night. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it, it also is something that comes into play is that there were teams that were going to have to wrestle three times in a night. So, you know, they probably couldn't have their standard traditional match. You know, had right. this been a match at a house show, they could have done 20, 25, 30 minutes. But just knowing that the Fantastics were going to go on, you know, save a little bit of energy and have a little left in the tank for their next matchup. Makes sense to me. That's why you're here, Roman. Call me out. Yeah. As, uh, we head into <laughs> our first of two intermissions. Yes, intermission time. Uh, another Superdome show slated for next month. Have to wait and see what that does. June the 14th. And don't plan your summer vacations, guys, because in July, it's the Great American Bash coming uh, nationwide. The Great American Bash Tour. The Great American Bash, for those of you that may be younger or not familiar, was basically like a month long version of like their WrestleMania. You know, just think of like a month long of super cards going on tour as a fan. It was phenomenal. And the bash came here in 1988 and I was one of the happiest people in town and I sat ringside for it. And Oh man, what a, what a treat it was to actually see a great American bash in person. And they never really phoned those cards in either because it wasn't the same match every night with the same outcome and the same wrestling moves in the matches. It was something different on almost every card. Maybe there was a feud involved, but every almost every different stop had a different gimmick match for that feud, or maybe a singles here becomes a tag there, or vice versa. Lots of cool stuff going on. Maybe a belt changes hands, but then changes hands back or to another person before the tour's over as well. So the Great American Bash, you never knew what was going to happen. You Maybe you got war games over here, but over here you got the Triple Cage Tower of Doom or whatever the case may be, a bunkhouse battle royal, whatever the case may be. But it was very cool. You never knew what you were going to get from bash to bash stop. And uh, I just always love the bash time of year. 
Yeah, and, and the way they would hype it, too, like you said, you know, you could see a title change. Like, how is Flair going to get through the whole month of defending his belt against all these different challenges? You know, he's really going to be put to the test. And then if he lost it, like, well, nobody can sustain that type of challenge during the whole bash. And, you know, it, it was drama. You know, it was drama, but it was excitement. No, they did a great job with that in 86 and 87, especially those are the two I've watched most recently, even the Flair's promo. You've got me out there for 30 days against 30 guys. You know, uh, no, he, he wasn't even putting himself over. He, he's even questioning, how does anyone go through this? I'm just going to do it. And he's a heel and he's still questioning, how am I going to do this? So I'm just going to do it the best way I can. And hopefully on the other side, I come out champion because even a heel nature boy, Ric Flair realizes this is ludicrous as far as, you know, going against a different guy every night, Jimmy Garvin, Ronnie Garvin, Dusty Rhodes, Magnum TA, Ronnie, you know, whomever the case may be, it was, it was almost a different opponent every bash stop so it, that was that was what really made it fun every week he was out there talking about his next challenges ahead and, and then you fast forward a little while later when garvin's the champ they on tv basically gave him a month off to prepare for one match against flair you know right. and here flair was defending the belt every night against a bunch of different challengers yeah you know i want to save that you know off air we were talking about maybe like a, a q a type show a grab bag type show you know answering some fans questions some of the listeners questions and things and i i look forward to doing something like that here in the near future but uh one of the topics i'd like to throw into the hat I, because i personally want to discuss it myself is that ronnie garvin title run because my opinions on that run are not uh what you typically hear from from most people out there so it's going to be a unique take for me i think in that one and I look forward to talking about that when we, you know, jump around and talk about various things, a variety of things on an upcoming episode. But yeah, I appreciate you throwing that in my head before the show got going here, Roman, because I think there's a lot of topics we could we could uh, really have some fun with. Oh, I, I love talking old school wrestling with you, with you. You know that whether it's on the air or off the air. So yeah, anytime we can get together and talk old school wrestling, it's a good time. So there you hear it, guys. Superdome, June the. 14th coming back already pretty ballsy by bill watts there although bill watts probably you know vince talks about his grapefruits then i guess uh, bill watts probably had watermelons because wow bill watts was something else but uh also guys we just mentioned it great american bash gonna be on tour this summer as well but i wrote what an odd spot on the show for an intermission roman because it happens before the last second round match i guess it was just timed out the way the clock fell I, i'm not really sure what the deal was there because we head back from intermission with one second round match left the unique pairing of black bart and gorgeous jimmy garvin with precious in his corner taking on seed number seven from japan it's the giant baba and tiger mask that's tiger mask 2 aka misawa and even though garvin and bart are heels the japanese team also get booed here shame on you new orleans and the odd pair of black bart and tiger mask gonna start this one out not much to speak of happens here, so Garvin in next for more of the same with Tiger Mask. I wrote mostly basics. Until, until, Misawa sends Garvin to the floor and delivers a baseball slide dropkick that sends Jimmy crashing into the guardrail, making a smashing noise as the crowd pops loud for that spot, wakes the crowd up Did that spot. Yeah, and uh, gosh, just to see Misawa back then, it just, one of my all-time favorite Japanese wrestlers. So anytime you can see him, it was nice. Yeah, it was great. Misawa does the old fake out, the flip over the top rope, teasing a dive but landing on the apron, then some more flippy shenanigans in the ring. Finally has the crowd awake. They're like, whoa, this guy's more than a mask. What else can he do? And curious to see. You can see the crowd really woke up. They wanted to see what was next. It was kind of like the jumping bomb angels in 87 WWF. It was like, didn't really expect much. But once they got going, the crowd was like, holy sh, these girls can work. You know, so unfortunately here. No, I was just going to say, exactly. You know, they, they saw him do something and it just kind of wet their appetite. Like, what else can he do? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Giant Baba then tags in. So things slow down as fast as they got started. We see some signature Baba chops and a Russian leg sweep taking Black Bart down. And then a Baba pile driver to Jimmy Garvin. Remember, that's legal now, guys. The pile driver here is Tiger Mask back in. And the heel duo of Garvin and Bart finally getting some semblance of offense in finally in this matchup. But that won't last long before Giant Baba back inside with an embarrassing slow motion shoulder tackle on Garvin and then a pair of shoulder tackles on Bart as well that almost has the crowd laughing at the awkwardness of it all. It just looks terrible. And uh, Baba then with a big chop on Bart and Tiger Mask in with a top rope crossbody, apparently for no reason. 
so that he can tag Baba back in with a big boot by the giant Baba going to get the win. Seven minutes and 51 seconds. I wrote, woof, that was not pretty. Tiger Mask Masawa just started to get things going. Could have been fun, Roman, but it became the Baba show. And at times, it was awkward to watch his moves, having to be oversold by the heels. Best part of the match was probably Precious arguing with Baba afterwards. I did pop for that. <laughs> you know, I had in my notes, you know, it's going to sound weird saying this after your commentary, but in a way, I kind of thought that Tiger Mask and Baba were good choices to represent Japan just just in their name value alone, because American fans had actually probably heard of them. You know, Baba was a former world champion, uh, the Japanese Andre the Giant, and Tiger Mask, the original version, Satoru Sayama, had wrestled on WWF TV and been in the magazine. So there are fans that might have been familiar with the Tiger Mask character. This version was Misawa. Even if, even if they weren't familiar with them, they'd probably seen or heard of Tiger Mask. So I, from that point, I thought it was good that those were the two representatives because if they had went with the Tenru or a Animal Haguchi or something like that, I don't think American fans would have had any clue who they were. So to me, this prestigious tournament added a little more international flavor with two better-known names from Japan as opposed to two lesser-known names, even though this wasn't a great match by any stretch. No, I think name value-wise, you really can't get any better if you're coming from the all-Japan side of things. I think you're right, Tiger Mask, even the look, even if you've never heard of him, I mean, you look at him, he just looks cool, right? So fans are at least going to pay attention to him, and then what he does in the ring is, you know, next level as well. Baba, also a different look, but also, as you said, anybody who's been paying attention for any length of period of time, collected magazines, knows their NWA stuff, Obviously, the giant Baba, like you said, the Japanese Andre the Giant in some degree. Baba could go. If you guys go back and watch the 60s, early 70s Baba, much like Andre, actually better than Andre, but much like Andre in his younger years, move around. He could do a lot of things. Very impressive. Fun to watch. Good wrestler, to be honest with you, for his size. But here it just was bad, and it gets worse. Uh, I have more comments, and not necessarily from me, but rather from the fans when we get to the uh, next round. Uh, with Giant Baba. It's it's pretty uh, sad, honestly, what some of the fans are out there shouting at him. But uh, we'll get to that when we get there. As we, we roll on, the second round now complete. Two upsets in that second round, but not really. Both the Fantastics and Sheep Herders, who have arguably had the toughest rounds of any of the teams thus far, they both advance into the quarterfinals. Now, the Fantastics, the only team not seeded at all to make it to the quarterfinals. And the way the tournament brackets fall? The Herders meet the Fantastics in those quarters, which means one of these teams could potentially make it to the semifinals. But before we can get to the semis, we have to make it through the quarters. As the quarterfinals begin, it's seed number three, NWA World Tag Team Champions, the Midnight Express, with Jim Cornette in their corner, taking on the Road Warriors. Seed three versus seed one in the quarters? Somebody didn't do this bracketing right, Roman. Well, we... (laughs) Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the the bracketing was interesting, but I am grateful we did have a lot of good matchups in the second night compared to the first night. So it's uh, two of the top level Crockett promotion teams right now, the Midnights and the Roadies out there with their respective managers, Cornette and Paul Ellering. In a fun sequence with Animal and Dennis Condry get things going, Animal eventually drop kicking Condry out to the floor, and then it's Hawk in next. And after a failed pose down by Condry against Hawk, very comical. Jim Cornette up on the apron to distract the ref to allow the Midnights to double team the Road Warrior, but Hawk tosses both Midnights off a double top wrist lock, and he rushes at the World Tag Team Champions with a double clothesline, flooring the Express. As the Midnights regroup and Condry comes back inside, landing a pile driver on Hawk, but per the usual Hawk no sell, Hawk dumping the Midnights out yet again. Did you ever? What did you think back in the day? Hawk no selling the pile driver, even from Jerry Lawler. Well, I, it, it made sense in the sense that, you know, they were supposed to be invincible and he had the thick neck and everything. And uh, if anybody could have sold it or no sold it, it would have been Hawk. So I, I, I guess with him, it didn't bother me too much. Yeah, it was odd. And it was uh, the story goes, at least Hawk, Hawk's version anyway, was that Jerry Lawler came up with that. He told him to no sell it, to pop up from it. And I kind of believe that Lawler knew how to get heat for himself and whomever he was working against, whatever he could do to draw the most money and make everybody look great in the process, because we can do this again, guys, and make even more money. 
it really caught me off guard when he did it with Lawler. But at the same time, I think as a kid, I, I thought, wow, that was awesome. He just stood up from a pile driver because nobody did. It didn't even matter if, you know, it wasn't even a guy's finisher, whether, you know, or it was, say it was a Paul Orndorff or a Dick Slater who did it sometimes, Terry Funk, whatever the case may be. Yeah, I get it. You, you put a guy down and that's, that's your finisher. But then there were guys who did it as a Harley Race, for instance, who may have just worked it into the sh- match, but even still, it netted you a near fall. And with Hawk, he just popped up every time, no matter who delivered it. And it was something to behold. I did like that he sold it a little more here, kind of shook it off, had to sell it a little bit, but he still got up and the Road Warriors clearly in control here as we get a great spot up next as Bobby Eaton tags into the ring. He tries to run to the floor, but gets pressed back inside by Animal, only to be immediately clotheslined back outside by Hawk. And then he stands up into a Road Warrior Animal clothesline on the outside as well. I wrote, only Bobby. What a great sequence of bumps and fun spots by Bobby Eaton. That was incredible to see. And like you said, Eaton was the right guy to do that. And just imagine the strength, you know, to pick a guy up over your head and slam him is one thing, but... No, who does that even now? It takes the guy from the outside, picks him up, and throws him over into the ring. You know, that was just, wow. <laughs> you have to see it. We we can't do it justice, but great spot in the match. Yeah, it was multiple spots, but it was like one fluid motion. They they put it, Bobby put it all together masterfully. Like, very few guys could have pulled that off, off back in that time frame. It just wasn't boom, boom, boom back then like it is now. And Bob Eaton was clearly way ahead of his time. As the match continues on, finally back inside the ring, the Midnights, they try a rocket launcher. Dennis Condry launching Eaton off the top rope with a crossbody onto Hawk, but Eaton gets caught and slammed down to the mat and slammed hard. And then from there, double backdrop by the Warriors on Eaton and Animal dropkicking Bobby back outside yet again. I wrote, poor Bobby. Bobby just couldn't catch a break. You know, the Midnights couldn't catch a break in this match. You know, it's like no matter what they tried, the Road Warriors were able to stop their plans. You know, this, this match definitely, if you're a Midnight Express fan, you might not have liked this match because nothing really went right their their way in this match. Now, if you were a Midnight Express fan and you came out for both sessions, you got a two minutes, essentially a squash match earlier in session one. And now this is what you get in session two. But Bobby eating a bumping machine here as Dennis Condry tags back in, but nothing seems to be working. This animal delivers a big power slam Animal then runs off the ropes, but he's tripped up on the outside by Jim Cornette. And referee Carl Fergie, he sees it. So, he calls for the bell? Jim Cornette's interference causes the disqualification. The Road Warriors will advance in 8 minutes and 8 seconds, but the Midnights are still the tag team champions, which they point out as they leave ringside. Yeah, it was a great way to still acknowledge the greatness of the Midnight Express and Fans are happy that the Road Warriors went on. You know, I I think a lot of the consensus going into this tournament, I think a lot of people felt that it was going to be the Road Warriors night. Yeah, I mean, they were the number one seed for a reason here. So the Midnight Express already eliminated. Bummer for me. I was a huge. I know a lot of people say they were now, but how many fans were really cheering all the heels back then? They truly were. Luckily, I have a lot of people that will back me up on this as a kid. The Midnights truly were one of my favorite tag teams in the NWA for many, many years. I was so sad when I realized they disappeared there near the end of 1990, but uh, it is what it is. The Midnight's eliminated here. Fun match for as long as it lasted. Midnight's really, they got no offense in here, Roman, but they could be built that way and still look great, which is awesome. It says a lot for the team. Bobby Eaton, just a tremendous bumper. Dennis Condry looked very fluid here. And now I really wish the Midnight's had went longer against Royal and Houston earlier because We didn't really get to see them shine at all on either show. So for what it was, probably the most fast-paced, exciting match thus far in the entire tournament, but still cut short. Would have liked to have seen it gone on longer. A comment from an interview that just keeps popping out in my head after reviewing this match was they had asked the Road Warriors, like on a shoot interview, who their favorite people to work with, and, and just talk with such conviction and without a shadow of a doubt goes, Bobby Eaton. Nobody was better than Bobby. Bobby. Bobby was the best. It just, everything was Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. And, you know, to be appreciated by your peers like that, I mean, just, it shows what a talent Bobby was. And I got to say, more and more as I watch, as the older I've gotten, I did not appreciate Dennis Condry as much as I should have back in the day. I don't think I did. You know, he was, 
Yeah, I think a lot of people didn't. And then you go back and watch, like, he was such a solid performer, and uh, he was great at what he did. His timing was great, and uh, didn't appreciate it. I loved the team back then, but I look back now, and I have a, a much bigger respect for Dennis Condry. Very innovative, very fluid in the ring, amazing. He keeps up. He works perfectly with Bobby Eaton because he's more of the, the serious wrestler. Bobby, with the high flyer things, Dennis Condry just takes it to you, beats you down. And, and just a normal body type, but he just, you believed when he worked you over that it hurt. And it, really, it's kind of funny watching where Condry came from with Phil Hickerson, with the Memphis Territory, things like that. And somehow, he part, not a lot of guys were able to make – guys who started in Memphis – didn't necessarily make it outside of the Memphis territory. Not too many anyway, unless you really had a, a great personality, a great character, or whatever the case may be. And Condry, he was one of those guys that really made it. And really, this could have been the downside of his career. And technically it is because he abruptly quits in the middle of all of it. But at the same time, I mean, he's on the downswing, kind of. You wouldn't know it because, you know, he spent a lot of years in the Memphis and other territories like that. But here we go in the Midnight Express, our shining World Tag Team Champions right now. Yeah, yeah, just legendary tag team. You can't say good enough things about the Midnight Express. And then, of, of course, with Cornette, I mean, I could watch their matches all day long. And you talked about Hawk uh, putting Bobby Eaton over like he did. That wasn't even a team that the roadies worked all the time because they didn't really mesh with the Road Warriors body type and wrestling type. But I'm not saying they didn't have good matches because I just watched one right here where the <laughs> Midnights didn't even get any offense in. Imagine when they got the heat how great it would have been for the big hot tag when they killed poor Bobby Eaton at the end. Let's face it, guys, it was going to be Bobby. But, man, they, I mean, they could have went another eight minutes with heat and a couple minutes to go home. They could have went nearly 20 minutes and just had a, a barn burner. And it wasn't built for that here in the tournament. I get it. But still, I mean, I, I see where Hawk's coming from, obviously. But it's amazing that th that's, that was his go-to so fast when he worked many other teams a whole lot more. Well, you know, Bobby, you know, as we all know, was such a great bump taker and – very unselfish in the ring. He wasn't afraid to put people on, you know, and it, of course the road warriors are going to look dominant against just about anybody, but Bobby made them look extra dominant. You know, right. like that spot we talked about in this match, you know, not everybody could have done what Bobby Eaton did in this match, no, you know, going not. over the top rope, getting clotheslined and just the way he sold. And uh, I can see why Hawk had all the praise in the world for Bobby Eaton. Uh, we go on quarterfinal actions, going to see Dr. Death, Steve Williams, and Terry Taylor taking on the Russian team of Ivan and Nikita Koloff, cornered by Eddie Gilbert and Korchenko once more. Now, we didn't get Rick Martell against Dr. Death and Taylor, but we do get Nikita against Doc. I won't say Nikita against Taylor because I saw Starcade 87 and it wasn't pretty. Well, well, the backstory was on that. Supposedly, Taylor was kind of afraid for his life. He thought Nikita was going to legitimately shoot on him. So that's probably why they didn't have the, the best match you've ever seen. Not a, not a lot of cooperation in that 20-minute snooze fest, but that's a ways off uh, here in uh, wrestling land of 86. And so we get going. Terry Taylor and Ivan Koloff going to start this one out. Fun back and forth, but it's not too long before Doc tags in and a big gorilla press slam complete with reps. Oh, the strength of that Dr. Death. Then from there, the baby faces work the arm of Uncle Ivan for, well, let's just say it was quite a while. But they keep it lively for the most part, allowing Ivan to make it to his corner to tag in every time they knew that Nikita wasn't there to tag back. So Nikita would be distracted down the apron, arguing with the other baby face on the outside. And then they would allow Ivan to get to his corner to make the tag, only for Nikita not to be there. And then Nikita would run back over to make the tag, and they would jerk Ivan back away. So at least they kept it lively. Yes, and, you know, the crowd's not going to complain if if the evil Russians are being uh, stretched or punished, you know, so they're going to savor every minute of that. No, if the baby faces are in control, and they're Americans here, guys, and on top of all of that, they're having fun with the Russians. They're duping the Russians by making them look like fools. The fans eating this up. That's how you get an arm bar spot over, guys. And after being in the ring for more than nine minutes, Ivan Koloff finally goes to the eyes of Dr. Death and tags in Nikita. And here it is, 10 minutes into the matchup. It's the Dr. Death Nikita Koloff showdown as the fans chant USA, USA. And Dr. Death tries a couple shoulder tackles that barely budge Nikita. But when the Russian nightmare mocks Williams, Doc sends him out of the ring with a big drop kick. I remember Animal doing that to someone before. It looked a lot prettier than Doc's dropkick. 
Well, to, to me, the docs just came completely out of nowhere. <laughs> that was what impressed me because I'd never seen him do that. You know, I've seen him work Japan and everything and just – I, to me, it was quick, and it came out of nowhere, and I was like, wow, I didn't know Doc, Doc had that in his bag of tricks. Yeah, you know, I've seen that exact spot done before, but it was Road Warrior Animal and Doc's spot, and it was very impressive drop kick, and you know, like you said, it comes out of nowhere, very explosive, and it was fun. I still, you know, the fans ate it up, that's for sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. So back inside, Nikita, he wants a test of strength as we get the good old Greco-Roman knuckle lock spot. And when nobody budges, it's Nikita with a cheap shot kick. But Doc, he's going to kick right back, not going to take it. And then from there, Nikita going to lure Doc into his corner where Williams is briefly double teamed by the Russians and they take over as Ivan Koloff tags in. And now the Russian bear, the machine of the team, and Nikita, they're making fast tags to work over Dr. Death as the ring announcer announces 15 minutes gone by. And those guys better be careful as there's only five minutes left in the time limit here. Ivan goes to that middle rope, but gets slammed off by Dr. Death and Steve Williams inadvertently with something similar to a Claymore kick. That's what it looked like by me, Roman, but the Koloff's right back in control of things. As Williams finally counters Ivan's offense with a power slam, and it's finally hot tag time to Terry Taylor. Doesn't quite get the effect of a Ted DiBiase, but Taylor in and quickly cut off and then thrown outside of the ring and into the steel rail as we learn that only two minutes remain in this 20-minute time limit. And then back inside, Taylor locked in a Nikita bear hug with only one minute to go. Kind of a weak move for this point in the match, Roman, but Doc tagged in, but referee Carl Fergie, he misses it, allowing the Russians to continue double-teaming Terry Taylor, and they get a near fall there, but... With mere seconds to go, nobody is even attempting for any high-impact moves or close counts. It's just the Russians tagging in and out, and Nikita leveling Taylor, finally, with the Russian sickle. But the bell had sounded. The end result, a 20-minute time limit draw, and both teams eliminated from the tournament. I thought this was a very good match, and one that deserved to go to 20 minutes. You know, you hate to see two teams get eliminated at once, but this had my interest. It had the crowd's interest. There was excitement. I, I, I like this match. I'm glad it went the full 20 minutes. You know, maybe it was just the newsletter writers. Maybe it was just the opposite of rose-colored glasses. But over the years, certain wrestlers have gotten a bad rap for various things they really didn't even deserve. And yeah, Nikita Koloff had some bad matches, especially early oh, on yeah. he was learning. Don't get me wrong, but this was a case. Now, granted, Ivan Koloff in the first half of the match by himself. But when the mat, when the flow got going, when the heels were doing the fast tags, Nikita Koloff was in there doing what he needed to do. He didn't look lost. He was very comfortable in there. Here's, here's my notes, guys. I wrote post-match the Koloffs. They lay Terry Taylor out on the floor and beat down on Doc in the ring before Korchenko enters the ring to join in. And that's when Nikita and Korchenko use the Russian chain to double clothesline Dr. Death. Then from there, Nikita choking Doc with the chain as whoever out there ringing the bell, they need to stop because the bell rings just goes on too long. Several minutes of bell ringing here, but a lot of help Taylor, Terry Taylor was here for Dr. Death in the match and beyond the match. Dr. Death, he needs Ted DiBiase back in his corner. Oh, no doubt about that. DiBiase's absence was uh, definitely missed. And, but one thing I wanted to kind of piggyback on when you were talking about Ivan, mm -hmm. that's what helped make this match. Of course, it's a tag match, but you were talking about Nikita, you know, kind of getting dumped on by the sheet writers and everything. Nikita was one of those guys that you had to pick and choose your spots with. You did not want to see Nikita in a 45 minute no. hour long hour match or no. Iron Man match. Right. You know, there was a, a match on bash 87, that uh, collector's tape that they edited with him and Luger, and I was still bored to tears, you know? So I Nikita remember. had to be used. To, yep, Nikita had to be used just right, and in this match, it was good. You had Ivan doing the selling for the first 10 minutes, you know? And so they picked their spots right with Nikita, and I, I thought that's what helped make this a good match. Yeah, my notes were pretty good match. The finish was whatever, but I, I, I wish they had picked up the pace a little more as they were given multiple time cues here. Five minutes, three minutes, two minutes, one minute, even 30 seconds remaining. So I wish they would have picked up the pace a little bit in that last minute or two. It just seemed like they weren't really trying to win, were the Russians at that point. And then, of course, he does hit that Russian sickle right after the bell. 
unfortunately, time limit had uh, elapsed, you know, ran out. So neither team will advance. Um, you know, I just wanted to touch on, you know, what happened post-match before I forgot. Well, I didn't mean to cut you off earlier when we were discussing Nikita Koloff. Uh, but yeah, I just, yeah, I thought he held his own here just fine. Yeah. And, you know, I like what you said too. When, when you, your condition as a fan, when you hear, you know, two more minutes left, you're expecting the match to ramp up a little bit. You know, right. false finishes and, oh, the good guy almost won. And you're expecting to be taken on that roller coaster ride. So when they don't do it, it's disappointing, you know, because you want to see them pull out all the stops. There's a million dollars on the line, and you only have two minutes to try to advance and collect a million dollars. And it would get more exciting in later years, especially in WCW, where they did the time limit all the time with the guys trading quick pinfalls back and forth and things like that, and even sometimes getting it to where they would have got the three if they'd had one more second left, to, you know, in the time limit and things. I wasn't looking for all of that. I was just looking for reality. Realistically, if I know there's one minute left, I'm not locking in a bear hug or uh, and it wasn't exactly. like I was trying to finish him off with it. it. It really looked like the Kilo was just trying to wear him down. There was just a lot of weird things going on in that last minute. It was like, why would you do this right now? If this was real life, you should be trying to get his shoulders to the mat. And they were just kind of just punching him and making tags and things and. Just, I, I wasn't a big well, fan I, of that. I wonder at this stage, you know, Nikita was pretty fresh, at, you sure. know, in his wrestling career and knew, you know, behind the scenes, who knows? Maybe he was blown up a little bit, you know? Maybe he was just like, gosh, let me put on a bear hug so I can catch my breath. I, I don't know. But, yeah, it's kind of peculiar that they didn't try to amp it up a little bit more towards the end. Well, we're not done here. We got more quarterfinal action, guys. It's the Sheep Herders, number nine seed, taking on the Fantastics. That's the team that defeated the Sheep Herders for the UWF Tag Team titles. Herders going to have Jack Victory in their corner here. Now, we have recently talked about this match. Not this match, but matches between these two on UWF TV. Uh, of course, Fantastics recently returning when they defeated the Sheep Herders for those UWF Tag Team titles. But now, instead, it's $1 million on the line as the Fantastics changing their gear for every match. It's like Macho Man and Elizabeth at WrestleMania 4. Before Macho Man and Elizabeth at WrestleMania 4, and the Sheep Herders going to salute that New Zealand flag, which leads to Bobby Fulton once again leading us, leading the fans in the Pledge of Allegiance. And the Fantastics clear the ring to start, and we get some stereo Fargo struts once more, and then we finally get to the action. Fun segment early on between Bobby Fulton and Luke Williams, and I wrote, God, I forgot how good Luke and Butch were before they went to the WWF. I mean, the timing, the bumping, they were troopers and they earned that bushwhacker run, making the most money of their life, doing the least of their entire career. It was like Vince paid them royalties for the career they had prior to coming to the WWF. Well, yeah, I, I had mentioned on a, on a previous podcast, it was almost like a lifetime achievement award, you know, like you guys have done great for so long and shed so many gallons of blood and, you know, we're going to give you a comedy act and, and pay you lots of money and you're not going to have to get hurt. It's just a really fun match here, guys. Back and forth until all four men wind up outside as Luke posts Bobby Fulton, who is now busted open and bleeding pretty good. First blood of the night, I wrote Roman. Wonder if Bill Watts gave them that directive here. As uh, Bobby Fulton just hamming it up for the camera outside. A tad too much for my liking. Uh, acting dazed and confused with the blood flowing. Bobby Fulton, the uh, facials he was making, just a little over the top. Too hokey for me. Uh, it... it went beyond the the cell job, if you will, of, of being busted open there. But the sheep herders in control until they collide, and Fulton makes that hot tag out to Tommy Rogers, and it looks like Luke now bleeding too, so the blood beginning to flow on both sides. Yeah, the crimson flowing always adds a little excitement, and before Fulton was bleeding, I don't know if you saw this, Ray, but I noticed mm -hmm. in the first couple minutes of the match it looked like he went to his forehead twice and tried to get blood and nothing happened. That was just something I put in my notes. Like what if he didn't gig hard enough or, or maybe I just thought he was going to blade, but you did see him go to his forehead a couple times before he actually bled, you know, like earlier in the match. Okay. Yeah. See, I didn't even, I didn't even catch that. It very well could have been, uh, but we, they don't have a problem here. Bobby Fulton busted open by this point as is Luke and it doesn't in there. Butch Miller in then sending Bobby Fulton into referee Tommy Gilbert, and then both men going tumbling through the ropes and into the cameraman on the outside. Meanwhile, Tommy Rogers still in control in the ring, taking on Luke Williams. Jack Victory outside hands off the flagpole to Butch, 
who nails Rogers in the back and then across the forehead. So you guessed it, guys. Tommy Rogers now also busted open. But then it's the Fantastics turn with the flagpole as they get possession and crack it over Butch's head and Jack Victory's head while they're at it. And now I'm pretty sure, Roman, that everyone in the entire match is bleeding. Yeah, I, I had it in my notes. If you like blood, you're going to like this match because even Jack Victory was bleeding, you know. Even, and that's even the corner man. Not very bleeding. often. Yeah, not, not 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 very often. Like you said, the corner man, the manager, the valet, whatever. When when they start bleeding, it's like, whoa, that's not something you see every day. Uh, match goes on, everybody bleeding everywhere. From there, Tommy Rogers and Luke fight over the flagpole as Tommy Gilbert, the referee, helped up by Tommy Young. Tommy Young here, obviously here for the world title match, I'd have to think. And uh, Tommy Gilbert sees the crazy melee and immediately signals for the bell, calling for a double disqualification. 14 minutes and 25 seconds. But the wild brawl continues on well after the bell. The referee's being tossed all around, blood everywhere. And then Lady Maxine arrives to help her man, no doubt. Jack Victory here. Lady Maxine ringside. She's out there to save her man. And a victory and uh, Lady Maxine both going to try to aid the sheep herders here as the Fantastics clear the ring. I wrote, what a wild scene to continue the storytelling of these two tag teams in the UWF with Luke Williams getting the award for Bleeder of the Night. The believability factor that these two teams hated each other, the way they kept fighting after the match, all the blood, and uh, just on a side note, there was way too many Tommies involved. Tommy uh, Gilbert, Tommy, Tommy Young, Young, Tommy Tommy's Rogers. I'm surprised, Tommy, I'm surprised Tommy Lasorda didn't get involved somehow. There you go. There you go. See, I didn't even factor Tommy Rogers in there. I was just looking at two referees named Tommy. Come on, guys. <laughs> so it, it is what it is. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot less Tommies after this match. Tommy Rogers, though, eliminated, along with partner Bobby Fulton and the Sheep Herders, everyone eliminated from the tournament. It's a shame to see great teams get eliminated. You know, you want to see one of them at least advance and two more teams that get eliminated. This was one of those times I wasn't really upset with the finish. I thought it was wild enough. It was great. It it aids the Cowboy in the storytelling he has coming up between the two teams. So it, it furthered the s- local storylines at the very least with neither team advancing. It's unfortunate. I would love to see the Fantastics go on to, uh, you know, whomever they made a face to these, you know, other teams, but it is what it is. As we roll on, we've got one more match here in the quarterfinals. It's the number two seed Magnum TA and Ronnie Garvin taking on the Giant Baba and Tiger Mask. What a odd matchup here. Uh, this should be interesting as Garvin and Misawa going to start this one out. Ugh, two tough guys. Garvin able to take Tiger Mask down into a half crab. But from there, the JCP babyface is going to take turns in the ring, trying to keep the masked man at bay. But Tiger finally able to get to his corner. And tag in the big man. In comes the giant Baba. And you can actually hear fans. One fan specifically shout, slow motion. As Baba steps into the ring, I wrote sad because they're referencing the moves from the first match earlier against Garvin and Black Bart. Baba was doing the moves, literally, it looked like in slow motion, which made them not very believable. And as Baba steps into the ring, he gets it again here from the fans who kind of have a chuckle at some of his moves. but. Nevertheless, here we go. It's the former NWA world champion, the Giant Baba, versus the future NWA world champion, Ronnie Garvin. As Baba takes over and works the arm of Garvin, Magnum TA finally tagging back in, but he eats a big Baba chop as Team All Japan takes over, making multiple tags to work over Magnum. Misawa telling referee Carl Fergie, ask him, ask him, locking in a chin lock, ask him, ref. And I had to laugh at Fergie's response. Uh, apparently no doesn't mean no in Japan as Carl Fergie has to tell Tiger Mask. And I quote, he said, no, Tiger Mask. It just sounded silly coming out of Carl Fergie's mouth, <laughs> referring to this guy as Tiger Mask. I wrote the ridiculousness of pro wrestling, Roman. Well, you watch Japanese matches from the 80s and 90s. You'll have a Japanese ref, two Japanese wrestlers, and they do the count in English. You know, you can hear them counting in English for them to get back in the ring, which I always thought was funny. You know, it was it was more, not even so much him trying to translate no to no. It was that he was calling him Tiger Mask. And I know that's his wrestling name, but it just sounded silly because he said it like in a full right. sentence. He said no, Tiger Mask. It was the silliness of it all. Just only in wrestling 
Is, it was my point, I guess, yep. I suppose. So, uh, but after several minutes, Magnum TA, he makes his way to tag in Garvin, who unloads with chops on Baba. But Baba comes right back, firing off chops of his own. And then from there, it's a four-way melee that sees the Japanese contingent collide center ring. And Magnum gains a near fall on Baba from there. Somehow, Tiger Mask takes over for the team, never tagged in. I'm not really complaining. Misawa dazzles with a cartwheel over a Magnum drop down and then a drop kick to TA before delivering a nice senton splash by Tiger Mask. Going to get the Japanese team a two count. And then Tiger Mask to the top rope for a cross body block, but it's caught in midair, sort of, and turned into the Magnum TA belly to belly suplex. And the local JCP team going to get the win nine minutes and 52 seconds. It was not the prettiest belly to belly I've ever seen in my life. No, and uh, not what they were you know, going you, for. You, no, and you talking about Giant Baba and slow motion and everything. The <laughs> next night he worked Wrestle Rock against Bulldog Bob Brown and uh it'd be pretty wise to have your fast forward button working during that match. That was that was definitely not a match of the year candidate. No, I mean uh on paper. I, I can't even imagine what it was like I haven't seen it in years, so I don't remember, but I, I can only guess what, what that match was like. Bulldog Bob Brown and Giant Baba in 1986. My God. Yeah, you know, and the, and the sad thing is, you know, we, we've talked about Baba not moving quick and everything. Obviously, you know, he was better when he was younger. You know, if sure. you see a match from this time frame and even later, sadly, you know, Baba got even slower in the late 80s, you know, and just his body, for those of you that aren't familiar with him, he's really super tall and really super thin. Like you can see his ribs. He was, he was awkward and gangly and, uh, and it's sad because he was a good athlete at one point. You know, he, he pitched professional baseball in Japan. Right. Yeah. He was, you know, so he was his earlier stuff in the ring was, was fantastic. Really good stuff. I, the first time I ever watched early Baba, I was, I was really impressed. I actually really fun. I enjoy watching his matches every time, you know, I can get watch some of the sixties, uh, uh, in, in 1970s matches with Baba, I, I'm happy to sit down and watch him. You know, it, it kind of reminds me of Andre the Giant. You know, fans know him in his later years in the WWF when he couldn't move and this and that. But you go back in time and watch him when he was like 380 pounds. I mean, I've got a match with him against Baron Von Roschke where he did a drop kick. You know, it's like, who can picture Andre doing a drop kick? They, they used to be tremendous athletes at one time. So to see them later on not be able to move around as much, it, it's kind of sad to see sometimes. Yeah, there's an IWE or maybe JWA. I can't remember what it was. Early 70s match with Andre. I think it's a six-man tag over there. And he does a couple things that are impressive. He jumps maybe three feet, four feet in the air to land a tombstone. So I don't care how good you are, mm -hmm. what what era you're in. I'm not letting a guy give me a tombstone four feet in the air, especially somebody that looks like that. But, you know, power to – I don't know who he was. Where I know, like, Tito Coppa and some other guys were on the other side. I don't remember who he did the move to. I was really impressed with that. But – there was a Kurt Hennig-esque uh, bump that Andre took at one point. I think off of a shoulder tackle or whatever, but he does a backflip bump. I'm just like, holy, sh you know, it blew my mind first time I ever saw that many years ago. But yeah, Andre was quite an athlete when he could move around a lot better. Same thing with Baba, but I agree with you. Very sickly. His arms are, are hard to look at, but his chest, the, the bones and, and the structure of his bodies. The first time I ever saw Baba, I believe, was a Crockett Cup tape. And uh, he wasn't even on it. I think it was just in the video. It may, may have been 86 here, uh, just in like the video footage, uh, the, the music video, I mean. And I just said, oh, my God, what's wrong with him? You know, I'd never seen, you know, seen him physically before. I'd only read about him. And so I just thought, I was like, oh, my God, what's wrong with that guy? It's like freaked me out. Kind of like when I saw Gorilla at that WrestleMania, near, you know, shortly before he passed away. It just didn't look right. But Bob obviously just built differently and, you know, had that. I guess he had the gi gigantism or whatever uh, as well, because he was right. a pretty big guy. Yeah, and uh, that would be fun one day to have a topic of, like, wrestlers you read about in magazines, and then you finally see them, like, you might be a little disappointed in. And Baba was one of those ones where getting the magazines back in the day, oh, former world heavyweight champion, you know, and then you see him, like, well, okay, back then he was well, good, but right now after he's not Max, so good. man, they did their job, though. You got to admit, they, I mean, I look forward to if I could ever see the Rochester Roadblock or Mondo Clean, who became Damian Demento. These guys were awesome in the magazines until they got to the television screen. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You you would think Kendo Nagasaki was the greatest thing since sliced bread. If you yeah. if you bought the magazines back in the day, then you see them, and like, eh. So the quarterfinals now over, guys. Bruce Pritchard announcing 
with the Doc Taylor and Koloff match going to a draw, and then the Sheep Herders Fantastics match going to a double disqualification. All four of those teams have now been eliminated from the tournament, and thus we will bypass the semifinals altogether. I wrote, boo, cheap. And we will go straight on to the finals later tonight with the two remaining teams, which will see the Road Warriors, the number one seed, take on the number two seed of Magnum TA and Ron Garvin. How about that? No, I was just going to say, you know, I agree with the boo. You know, it's just, it's the semifinals and you don't get to see anybody. I mean, I know there's politics involved and, hey, we don't want our guys losing to this and, you know, all the backstage politics and everything. But as a fan, you're just skipping the semifinals and going straight to the finals. Like, I would feel a little cheated, you know, if I if I put down my hard-earned money. Like, damn, I don't even get to see, like, the whole build-up to the finals. Right. So uh, we've seen a lot of, to say the least, we've seen a lot of tag team action, Roman. So we're going to head off to non-tournament action now, giving the fans a break from that tag team scene for a couple of singles bouts featuring some championships on the line. And first up, it's the UWF's North American title, very familiar to the local fans, the top title belt here in the Mid-South UWF promotion as the North American champion Hacksaw Jim Duggan taking on the former champion Dick Slater. As Jim Ross takes over here as guest ring announcer, oddly Earl Hebner, the referee, for the Mid-South match. And for those who don't know the backstory, ready for the convolutedness again, guys, Cowboy Bill Watts been screwing Dick Slater as of late and then tricked the then North American and TV champion Dick Slater into signing a contract to defend the TV title against anyone. Well, that anyone turned out to be Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Slater he had offered to allow Buzz Sawyer to defend that TV title for him. Problem was, Bill Watts put the North American title on the contract instead, rather than that TV belt. Thus, Buzz Sawyer was forced to defend Slater's North American title. And well, you guys can guess what happened from there. Jim Duggan defeating Mad Dog for that North American belt, leaving Dick Slater upset. So Slater loses the North American title, without ever actually losing the North American title. He truly has a real gripe here, Roman. He was never beaten for the belt, and he has his chance to get it back right here at the Crockett Cup. And then on commentary, they mentioned that they had to get a ref from another conference just to make sure this is a fair fair match. There you go. So Bill Watts finally agrees to be fair. Uh, We'll we'll get to a little bit more of that at the end of the matchup here. As you guys might expect, the match starts off a slobber knocker, if you will. Both guys battling it out until Slater gets Duggan on the floor and sends him into the guardrail, causing the railing to fall over. Duggan (laughs) dropped down on top of it. Really cool spot there. Looked cool anyway, as Dick Slater takes over control of the match, even driving the microphone into Hacksaw's head. Dickie finally going up top for his patented jumping elbow, but he comes down into a big punch to the gut from Hacksaw Duggan, and Duggan able to fire up series of big jabs and the old glory knee drop. Going to get him a two count, but Dick Slater comes back, blocking an atomic drop and landing that elbow to Duggan once more. Dick down for the cover, one, two, but Hacksaw kicks out, and Dick lands on top of Earl Hebner. Hacksaw kicking him off so hard, Slater up in the air lands on top of the referee, but Slater able to catch himself. So Hebner saved, or so we thought. Uh, The always thinking Slater realizes his opportunity, being thrown off of the cover and onto the referee. Dick deliberately drives a knee into the back of Hebner while making it appear inadvertent. Always thinking Dick Slater there, guys. I didn't call him Dirty Dick for no reason. Uh, Duggan then missing a charge, the big spear into the corner, cracking the turnbuckle hard and Slater connecting, this time off the top rope with that standing big elbow. And with Hebner down, Dick dragging Earl over to make the count. Slow go here by the referee. One, two, no, you only blame Slater for that. As uh, Duggan kicks out, Duggan manages to counter a Slater pile driver with a backdrop. But Dickey stays on top, tying Hacksaw up in the ropes. Tough guy. But Earl Hebner not going to let Dickey do anything. Dickish. Forcing Slater away from Duggan while he's caught in the ropes. And while Slater pushes Earl aside, Duggan escapes the ropes and sets up for that three-point stance. Slater turning around into the Hacksaw spear. And Duggan makes the cover one, two, three. Match goes nine minutes and ten seconds. Hacksaw Duggan will retain, and this match will be Slater's swan song 
in the UWF as he'll soon pop up as the Rebel on WWF TV. And man, Vince surely did not know what to do with Slater. You know, there's so many things they could have done. He just wasn't a good fit in the WWE, but this match was a brawl from beginning to end. And on a personal note, it, it was the last big, big card, I guess you could say that Duggan would defend the North American title because a month right. later it would turn into the UWF. They would have the tournament, but, uh, I always liked the 27 pounds of gold. You know, as a kid, when I would see that UW, or I'm sorry, the North American, North American title yeah. being brought out, very few wrestlers could even wear it. It was so big, you know? And just to me, I was like, that's what a champion should be lugging around, a big belt like that. You know, I just <laughs> thought, I always thought that was a cool visual. Oh, yeah. I always remember when Brad Armstrong had the belt. It just uh, didn't look good on certain guys. <laughs> Brad was one of the smaller guys that, that held that North American title, but... You're right. What a what a gigantic belt. And uh, Axel Jim Duggett weren't proud for the brief time period he has it here. And it, it was indeed a fight from beginning to end. Dick Slater and Duggan. I wish we could have gotten more out of them a few months of this. But Slater now finishing up with the company actually just stuck around to work the Crockett Cup here. Get a good payday on the way out as Hacksaw Jim Duggan retains. And there's no more question now, although there may be on TV. But at this point, in all reality, no more question as to who the real champion is as Duggan defeats the former champion, Dick Slater. Yeah, and I, I wonder if they, I don't know, just thinking out, out loud to myself, like, had they made this like a loser leaves town match? Because like you said, Slater was gone after this. You know, that, that's another route, another stipulation they could have put into it to kind of put the, uh, the the bow on the package, so to speak. But yeah, this was a good match, and uh, Duggan, Duggan looked strong, you know. He looked strong going into the merging of the Mid-South becoming the UWF. Yeah, fun little battle there. We go, we come a long way in just a short period of time. Dick Slater having those big matches with Jake Roberts not that long ago, and you know gets screwed out of his belt. He gets his chance, his opportunity here. It's just an opportunity, pal. Nothing promised to you, but uh, he gets his opportunity to try to win the belt back. But no, it's proven Duggan deserves to be the North American champion. And speaking of champions, we go on the NWA World Title on the line. Going to see champion Nature Boy Ric Flair. Take on the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, with Baby Doll, the perfect 10 in his corner here. Paul Bosch from Houston Territory out here to introduce this one. And Tommy Young out here to officiate. And a little feeling out process to start this matchup like they haven't done that before. But Flair going to find himself on the wrong end of some American dream style jabs and a little flip flop and fly action. And a couple of dusty elbows sends the nature boy out to the floor early on in this one. But Ric Flair going to regroup, and he gets Dusty down for a pair of patented Nature Boy knee drops before taunting Baby Doll at ringside. And those knee drops appear to have busted Big Dust open. But just to be sure, Flair sends Rhodes into the ring post as well. So a little more gigging from the American Dream as Flair goes back to the well, but misses a third knee drop. And Dusty going to drag the Nature Boy to the corner where he crotches Rick around the steel post. Apparently not a disqualification. In a world title match, I guess, as a Rhodes has a little fun at Flair's expense before Rick catches Big Dust in a sleeper hold, which Rhodes eventually fights out of. Was there ever any doubt, guys? Flair then takes Dusty to school as he works over his leg and locks it in, Roman, the figure four. Woo! But Dusty, he fights and he fights. Sell job. Great job here by Dusty Rhodes selling. But he eventually turns the hold over, reversing the figure four, forcing Rick to release the hold. And to avoid revenge from the dream, Flair, he rolls to the floor. But Dusty gonna follow him out, and he posts the Nature Boy. Twice, as we clearly, on camera, see Rick getting his blade job on here. Uh, both shots of uh, the ring post. Flair gonna gig twice. And now both guys bleeding. No shocker, Flair and Dusty. But Flair gonna try a slingshot sunset flip back in the ring. But Dusty counters by getting funky like a monkey, baby. And Flair takes a flip into the corner, tied upside down into that tree of woe. Dusty working him over. Multiple spots done, multiple covers by Rhodes. But Flair gets his foot on the bottom rope each and every time. You want to throw anything in here, Roman, before we get to the finish? No, you're, you're doing good. You're on a roll. All right, guys. I just wanted to make sure you guys knew Roman was still here. I wasn't trying to cut you off, buddy. <laughs> you're good. And now it's Dusty's turn to lock on the figure four. Now it's Rhodes applying the figure four to the world champion, Ric Flair. Flair writhing in pain, but finally reaches the ropes for the break. And Flair, bleeding good now, to no surprise, he goes up top. 
but is caught, also to no surprise, and slammed off by the American Dream, and Dusty plows Flair over with a couple of shoulder tackles, but Flair bumps into the referee, Tommy Young, sending Young through the ropes and out to the floor. Meanwhile, Tommy Young now down and out Dusty with an inside cradle. I won't call it a small package because Dusty's involved, but nobody to count Tommy Young down, so we see a shot of Baby Doll reviving Tommy Young and aiding him back into the ring. But Flair rushes over and begins to lay his hands on Baby Doll, trying to smooch it up with a valet, but Baby Doll fights him off and Flair turns around and he's nailed by Dusty Rhodes, who has taken his boot off and levels Flair now with that foreign object. Becomes a foreign object because it's no longer on his foot thus drawing the disqualification. Dusty Rhodes DQ'd for using that boot as a weapon as he knocks Flair out cold. So the world champion going to retain, winning on a DQ, match went 20 minutes and 12 seconds, and in, a, in an LOL moment, when Tommy Young raises the unconscious Flair's hand in victory, Dusty looks at Tommy Young and clocks him over the head with the boot as well, Young taking a hilarious Greg Valentine-esque slow tree fall to the mat. Ric Flair going to retain the title. Dusty, though, steals the NWA world title belt here, leaves with the belt and baby doll in the longest match of the night by a few seconds anyway. So there it is. Uh, fun little world title match. Uh, no real finish here, but it is what it is. And uh, Dusty came to entertain tonight. Ric Flair always has his working boots on. I enjoyed it. Yeah, and Shivani mentions that Dusty had his leg broken at the hands of Flair and the Anderson, so he's wearing this specially made boot. So when Flair hits Dusty with the boot, Shivani says that boot is lo lined with steel. And I, I had that Dusty must have been tough as nails because approximately 20 seconds after getting hit in the head with this boot lined in steel, he's back on his feet. But when Flair and Tommy Young sold getting hit by the boot by Dusty, right. you know, they, they weren't back up in 20 20 seconds and then Actually, also you know, I had I, did, I was just gonna say I just had a little kind of goofy comment here like it's a good thing smoking Joe Frazier wasn't the ref because he would have oh, stopped man. the bout due to excessive blood like he did at Stark at 84 yeah like 10 minutes earlier uh yeah yeah well, we still get a DQ here but I love the spot after the match clocking Tom Young after he ra he raises Flair's hand Flair's out cold Tom Young raises his hand he's the winner and Dusty kind of looks at him and just clocks him over the head over the head uh with a boot and Tom Young takes that slow tree fall down to the mat. But, you know, I did catch something before they cut away from the match. Flair's out cold, and you could argue because he wrestled for 20 minutes also, but Tommy Young was already getting back to his feet. I was like, why is Tommy Young not selling the boot, you know, for as long as Flair? It was it's kind of interesting, but it is what it is. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, have to, I'll have to pay attention to that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. notice uh, how quick Tommy Young got back up. Yeah. All right, guys, a reminder, with uh, two matches in the quarterfinals leading to double eliminations, the remaining two teams in the semifinals both received buys straight to the finals here of the Crockett Cup. So here we are. We've made it, Roman, to the final match of the night. It's the finals of the first annual Crockett Cup. And we have the Road Warriors, which a lot of people predicted would win it or go this far. And then we look back now all these years later, you know, like I mentioned with Garvin and T.A., when they were seated so high, I guess that was kind of a little uh, foresight to what to come, you know, that they would go pretty far in the tournament, and they did. Here they are in the finals against the Road Warriors. Now, we never saw the bracketing, so we didn't know how this was going to play out. But as a kid, I had always assumed myself that we would uh, wind up with the Roadies and the Midnight Express. Not very hard to figure out, guys. I know the number one and number three seeds, are, but uh, the World Tag Team Champions and the Road Warriors, what a shock. But, I mean, obviously... Magnum TA also involved here, so that might have something to do with them making it to the finals. As Tony Schiavone, the ring announcer here for this one, and referee going to be Earl Hebner. No shenanigans, no UWF shenanigans here. As we start out with a quick sequence from Magnum and Road Warrior Animal, both moving fast and looking for control. Then it's Hawk and Ronnie Garvin's turn in the ring. As Hawk works Ron down to the mat, we see that broken right hand. Remember that? We talked about that last week. Here on Regional Wrestling, Garvin had recently had his hand, quote unquote, broken at the hands of Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard on WTBS. So Garvin's initially actually supposed to be selling that tape fist is taped for a reason. It's supposed to be a broken hand. So his finisher, that hand of stone, we're going to see if that comes into play here and how effective it can be. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, well, 
Well, we'll get to it. We won't spoil it yet, but we'll get to what happens with the hand. Yeah, it won't take long as a uh, Road Warrior Hawk and big press slam on Ronnie Garvin. Don't see that every day. But Hawk missing a diving something off the middle rope, and it's Garvin's turn to lay it in on the Road Warrior. Then Magnum TA back inside, but the roadies use some quick double team thinking to take over. And then Animal wearing Magnum TA down with a bear hug before Hawk in with a gut rich suplex. Going to get the roadies a two. Hawk then delivering the body breaker, that over-the-shoulder backbreaker, dropping down to his knees, Korchenko style, if you will. So he stole Korchenko's finisher. How about that? Only it looked better here, Roman. Well, yeah, I don't think it's <laughs> too hard to improve on a Korchenko move. I suppose not. But when a guy only has two moves and you steal it, you know, you're kind of showing him up when you look better. But... <laughs> Nevertheless, Korchenko, when he does it, it gets him a three count. Here, Hawk only going to get a two. Was it the way he delivered the move, or was it the style of opponent here? Uh, but the roadies, they continue to dominate as Road Warrior Animal with a power slam on Magnum. Gets them yet another near fall. And then Animal for an Irish whip into the corner, but Magnum counters. And Animal bounces out into the belly-to-belly -belly out of nowhere by Magnum T8. That's his finisher, for those who don't know. Magnum dropping Animal with a belly-to-belly -belly suplex. Gets the one the two, but Hawk breaks it up. Take notes, Wahoo. Finally, it's a hot tag to Ronnie Garvin and Hawk. Garvin and Hawk trading headbutts until both go down. Ron up and eventually blasting Hawk with that hand of stone. Hawk goes down hard. Can Ronnie capitalize? Landing Hawk, that big hand of stone, that taped fist. As we see Garvin grabbed at that taped up broken hand, the same hand he just used to knock Hawk out with. Garvin goes down in pain, writhing in pain, clutching at his broken hand. Is Animal going to tag in with a crappy-looking left-handed clothesline? Kind of catches Garvin off guard, and the Road Warriors take the advantage and get the win. Match goes 9 minutes and 48 seconds. Not a big fan of that finish. No, but I, I did like the fact that the Road Warriors survived the belly-to-belly -belly and, the, and the punch from the hands of Stone. Oh, yeah. I, I thought those were just... Two little nuggets that help them make them look even stronger, he, despite, you know, in or in addition to winning the Crockett Cup itself. No, very cool that they both got their finishers in. Like you said, the roadies survived both the Hand of Stone and the Belly to Belly. I'm fine with the psychology of Garvin selling it. I just didn't like how it played right directly into the finish. He, he wasn't able to defend himself. He just kind of <laughs> walked into the finish, and the finish was eh, kind of lame. It just, Animal didn't really connect with it really all that great. I think that was a lot of the, the flatness for me. And they, they get the win, though. The roadies uh, win it all. The roadies have done it. They are the first ever Crockett Cup champions. A million dollars as a Magnum TA and Hawk going to trade some quick shots before TA turns his attention to tending to his partner after the matchup. Ronnie Garvin down as the Road Warriors are presented the Crockett Cup trophy, Roman. And then Mrs. Jim Crockett Sr. enters the ring to present them with the $1 million check. As the Road Warriors shake hands with promoters Jim Crockett and Bill Watts, Tony Schiavone again announces the roadies as the winners of the first ever Crockett Cup. And let's not forget, one of the most important things of the post-match was when Mrs. Crockett comes in and presents the check to these two champions, the Road Runners. Oh, she called yeah. them the Road Runners. I was <laughs> dying. And I'm like, that did not make it to the Turner Home Video version, but it was on the Peacock when she called yeah. them the Road Runners. I almost fell out of my chair. I'm glad you uh, pointed that out. I heard that, and uh, I didn't put it in my notes because I heard it after I'd already written my notes. And I went back and watched that the finals again without the uh, commentary uh, added in. So, no, they're very cool. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, it, well, it, you know, it, it is what it is. <laughs> One one thing that to me was apparent uh, during this match, you know, the, the crowd was pretty much dead. I, I think they were spent from the from the night. You know, the the afternoon session. I, you know, it'd be interesting to see how many fans went to both sessions, how many went to one. You know, I, there's no way to quantify that. No. I mean, we'll never know, but it'd be kind of curious. But you can tell they were spent. You know, when the Road Warriors won, there was a big pop, but during the match, it was kind of quiet, and it just got me thinking. Like as great as the Crockett Cup is, like how much this could have been used as a learning tool. Like, all right, let, let's not have everything in one night. Let, let's make it over two. Let's have night one on Saturday, night two on Sunday. You know, right. that way the fans can catch their breath a little bit. 
No, I agree. And I mean, really, what are you going to do with two hours of downtime between 5 and 7 p.m.? Maybe go get something to eat, maybe run back to a hotel, maybe go home for a little bit. But in all reality, I mean, you're kind of checked out. <laughs> you know, you just watched three hours of wrestling. Now, do you really want to go back and see three hours more? Eh, I mean, as the night goes on, as you said, the fans are still popping, but it's not for everything. It's just for the most important parts. But I also think that goes into the booking. Two of your, four of your top baby faces in Jim Crockett promotions. Who do you cheer for? You know, everybody loved Magnum TA, but everybody loved the Road Warriors. So it's kind of hard. Right. You know, it's, it's hard to applaud. But at the same time, you know, the roadies are the real tag team here. Garvin and Magnum had never even teamed before. And somehow they made it to the finals because Jim Crockett promotions after all. But we started with 24 teams, whittled it down to one, the first ever Jim Crockett Memorial Tag Team Cup Tournament champions are indeed Hawk and Animal, the Road Warriors, and that million dollars. I uh, hope that was uh, wrote out to the proper team name there on the check. I didn't catch that. <laughs> and just just something, I guess, uh, I'm going to sound like a bonehead, but I'm going to kind of contradict myself here. Just okay. after thinking about this last match, maybe they did do the right thing by not having the semifinals, because had you added a couple more matches, right. by the time this last match came, maybe the crowd would have been even more dead if right. that was possible. So maybe they knew something, but just as a fan on the outside, like it would have been nice to see a Fantastics advance, a sheep or somebody. There were so many great legitimate tag teams that could not advance due to all the count outs and disqualifications and whatnot. Yeah. At least they, they really didn't overdo it with the DQs and, and whatnot throughout the show. Like I had feared walking in like a lot of WrestleMania, early WrestleManias and things of that nature where, we can't really bury anyone, pal. We can't afford to have either one of these guys lose and things like that. So, right. yeah, we, we get some double eliminations where they they were apparently needed. And there probably was some politics involved with two different mm. promotions and maybe even some outside teams here. You know, obviously, the Japanese team had to advance at least one round. They didn't come over here to do nothing. But I'd like to see what would have happened with Rick Martel and Dino Bravo had they, uh, you know, actually competed here. It would have been interesting. But it is what it is, and the first ever Crockett Cup in the books, which means when we return next time, Roman, we'll be back to UWF television. It's all about the UWF storylines. And, you know, there's so much going on there, too. That That's going to be great to, to get back to that as well. And uh, just so much excitement. Like, like, I'm so we're doing this time frame, you know, that this was a great time frame for wrestling, and it's been awesome for me to – hop back in the time machine and talk about all this stuff from 1986. Oh, most definitely. And, you know, the best is yet to come. I know we preach that all the time, but really when you think about it, you get to May or so and everything just kind of just changes. A really big shake up all of that Kin Mantel, Dallas-esque talent and things of that nature coming in. The, the entire landscape changes almost overnight, really. Even Bill Watts coming back in the ring. Spoiler alert, guys. Lots of fun things coming very soon. And then, you know, like I alluded to earlier, of course, in May, you get the crowning of a new champion to represent your company. You know, that that tournament was a big deal. And and something I always loved about the UWF was that as great as Ross was on commentary, I loved listening to him. I always thought it was fun when, you know, you get D.B. Aussie one week and then Hayes the next week on commentary or something like that. Like Like the kind of wrestlers insights when they would be on commentary you pick the right wrestler to do the commentary with ross like i thought hayes and ross were were dynamite you know and that's something that's very kind of underrated about the uwf during that time at least for me i i enjoyed their commentary i thought they were a dynamic tag t uh, tag team on the mic yeah as much as i loathed doc Hendricks on the mic i loved michael hayes here in the uwf uh i didn't really care for hayes uh co-hosting they tried to recreate that in 89 for a little bit with Hayes co-hosting with Jim Ross on that Saturday night 605 show. But um, I, I don't think they ever had the magic that they had that they once had here in the UWF. It was the best. And uh, at the same time, guys, starting with the summer months, I got a lot of raw feed, you know, of the original uncut versions of the TV tapings. I'm sure you have them as well, Roman. Um, maybe I'll play some sound bites here for some people. Lots of uh, words <laughs> uh, being said that probably wouldn't fly on television back in the day, unedited. Mind you, from Jim Ross, Michael Hayes, things of that nature. Maybe we'll play a few, give everybody a few laughs at some of the things they were saying in between the matches and whatnot. Yeah, and it was funny. There was one I can recall where it just shows what a different time it was, where I believe Hayes was with Ross at the desk and DiBiase came up and they had a brawl. And 
I believe it was it was that. But anyway, at one point, Ross goes, what the hell is going on? And he comes back from commercial break and apologized for saying the word hell. Right. Yeah. You know, like it was a big deal. Like, oh, I I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I got caught up in the moment. I mean, that was a big. I'm like, wow, have times changed? Well, you know, they were uh, airing shows up there in the Bible Belt and things. They had to watch their P's and Q's, I suppose. But uh, it's it's going to be a fun time. I mean, lots of great stuff coming very soon, guys. So when we do return together, Roman, it's going to be back to UWF television. So many things going on. Like you said, upcoming uh, North American title going to be retired. And we're going to have a UWF heavyweight champion crown. Why didn't they do that with the tag team titles? I think they would just change the name here for Duggan. Poor Hacksaw. Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of felt bad for, for Duggan. I mean, I know it was excitement having, you know, another tournament. They were no, kind of known for their tournaments, but they had another tournament. But I just thought it would have been nice to just, hey, we're renaming the North American title, the UWF title, you know, Duggan's still our champion. You know, I, I thought that would have been kind of cool. But, you know, it, you can't complain when, when Gordy's put in the, a prominent position either. You know, that was a great move to put Gordy in there and then all the excitement with the Freebirds getting involved and everything. So lots of exciting things to talk about coming up in the UWF podcast. Absolutely guys. So stay tuned. I'm going to have more Georgia 81 coming back with Jamie Ward too. Jamie, hope you're enjoying your vacation. Going to be back soon here on the show as well. But for now, Roman, we're going to wrap things up. Want to thank everybody for listening these last two hours, finishing up Crockett cup 86. It's been a blast doing a super show, uh, two super shows technically with you, Roman. Oh, I had a blast too. And thank you again, everybody out there for listening. And, uh, I, I know we, our schedules are kind of crazy and everything, but we appreciate your patience and, uh, and, uh, listening to the podcast. And that's going to close it out guys. Crockett cup 86 in the books. will return to UWF TV here next time around with Roman Gomez. Of course, Jamie Ward going to be back from vacation fairly soon as well. Going to get back into Georgia 1981. And I've got new projects on the horizon. I'm hearing a buzz of the AWA, Memphis, the Portland Territory. Lots of research being done. And let's not forget the Wrestling Stoop podcast coming soon with Mr. Bob Roop. That is going to be a blast. So until then, want to thank Roman Gomez once again here on this excursion, this voyage through Crockett Cup 86. More fun coming right around the corner. More UWF on the way. And until then, this is Ray Russell. You can follow me on Twitter at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. And we'll be back soon with more regional wrestling, where we talk the territories. Hey.